Looking lovely tonight. Mmm. Yeah, uh, that's all I know. Mmm. Mm -mm -mm. God, we could go so many ways with that. I don't know why, but it sounds like fun. The Ronald Penton is here, everyone. He likes a good wave. BBD Warrior, good to have you here. Howard, thanks for coming on in. John Bowlerman, good to see you, my friend. Uh, I think we're caught up there. And um, Van Gogh, good to have you here. UFO Toronto, welcome back. And Minister Elaine, thank you for joining us. I hope you had a lovely day. I think we're caught up. I think we're caught up. Ian Rogers is our guest. We're going to get going in about 30 seconds here. want to remind you, a great way to support Spaced Out Radio. If you're new, hit that subscribe button. Ring that bell so you know when we're coming on live. And, of course, the Super Chat is always open. We really appreciate anything you do there. It really helps us out. And don't forget to spread the word on social media as well. We're going to talk some UFOs. We're going to talk some ghosts tonight. Ian Rogers, you know, great high and tight mustache beard combination. If you want to have a good look, hi, gorgeous Jules. Hi, lovely Wrench Kira. How are you? We're going to get going here in five seconds. Sit back, relax. Let's have some fun. Here we go. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at spaced out radio and on Instagram at spaced out radio show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Oh, we got a good show for you all tonight. Ian Rogers, good Canadian kid from Peterborough, Ontario. You know Don Cherry would be proud. He is the author of the award-winning collection, Every House is Haunted. The book was optioned by Sam Raimi, and a feature film on one of the stories, The House on Ashley Avenue, is actually currently in development at Netflix. In addition to his writing, Ian was a central figure in the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation documentary, UFO Town, which explored his his days as a teenage UFO investigator. He is also an accomplished artist, having published a comic strip in his local paper at the age of 12 as well. This guy is talented. He's all over the media. He's done time in newspapers, radio, and, uh, you know, he's got a good, good, solid beard and mustache combination as well. Ian Rogers, welcome to Spaced Out Radio for the first time. How are you? I'm great, Dave. Thanks very much for having me. Oh, we're glad that you were here, man. How do you get started in the weird and strange at the age of 12? Normally, that freaks a lot of kids out. Well, I think the best way is to be raised on it. So it came totally from my mom and my dad. Uh, my Probably my mom, mostly. She uh, she loved a good ghost story. She loved horror movies. Um, she was from uh, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Um, rich in folklore, um, supernatural I think um, every single one of my aunts and uncles, all my cousins, every single one of them had a ghost story to tell. And it wasn't even just designed to scare you. It was always like this was stuff that really happened to them. It was it was never embellished. It, it was always these really weird, simple things. I followed a person in my house um, and it turned out that there was no one home. And I, I was following a ghost, you know, like really, really simple stuff or weird animals that would show up around the house, ghost cats and stuff. So I think um, the way that... Um, they told those stories as just a part of their daily life is what really uh, influenced me as a, uh, you know, sort of a young uh, investigator of the supernatural and then into a, uh, a writer of, of fictional supernatural stories. Did you always want to be a writer? 
You know, when I was when I was a teenager, I thought I was going to be a, a, a movie director. Actually, I thought I was going to be sort of um, a David Cronenberg, David Lynch uh, mashup. You know, I was uh, I love movies. I still love movies. Um, so I used to write screenplays. Uh, I thought I was going to go off to uh, York University and take the film studies program. Um, but my path went another way, and I started writing um, short stories because uh, movies cost a lot of money to make, even even independent movies. But it doesn't cost anything to write a story. So um, I went that way. I started publishing short stories, and then I moved on to novelettes and novellas, and then I finally published a couple of short story collections. Good for you. Good for you for following your passion and, you know, putting pen to paper or fingers to keyboard, whatever you want to call it. You know, we really do appreciate that because your response here, you know, for somebody like you in Canada, there's not a lot of writers across our great nation that are really taking the paranormal and UFOs to task on some of these great Canadian stories that are out there. I'm curious, as a Canadian writer of this genre, is that disappointing to you to know that there are so few of you out there? I mean, it's disappointing in the sense that you might feel a little more isolated among your peers. I mean, there's a lot of actually really great um, uh, science fiction, fantasy and horror writers in Canada, but it maybe we're not as well known on sort of the global stage, especially when you're next to such a powerhouse neighbor like the United States, where there's also so many huge writers like your Stephen King's and your Peter Strobe's. Um, so I don't feel I feel a little bad about it. But then on the other hand, I feel like it's people are always interested in discovering something new. So if they don't know who I am, if they don't know who my peers are or what Canadian uh, ghost mythology and folklore looks like, um, I'm happily, you know, I'm happy to tell them, you know, I'm happy to show them. So I, th I think that it's something that they find for themselves. You know, it's, it's sort of the good and the bad of that. You mentioned as a kid that uh, you kind of grew up in this type of household. That's a rarity and an oddity because most kids in Canada were playing hockey in the winter or curling or out snowmobiling or skiing. And in the summer, it's baseball, fishing, you know, I'm not going to say the S word for soccer, you know, because I don't wish that on any child. But I mean, you know, there's a lot of interesting things to do out here, especially the more north that you go out of the suburbs. So for you growing up in a in a household where this was the norm, what was that like? Well, you know, I was uh, I was sort of bookish, you know, I was a small kid, kind of geeky. And um, my parents influence my father was in the RCMP, and my mom was a stay at home mom. And it was just around the house. I mean, it was always, my mom was always had Stephen King books around the house. And my dad always had like Louis L'Amour Westerns and in hundreds of National Geographics. So like that was the media that I was soaking in at that age. Um, so it was just, um, you know, I was always drawing, you know, that was one thing I think I did before even writing. I was always drawing. I was always uh, drawing uh, cartoons or I was drawing monsters that I saw in movies. Uh, my parents uh, didn't really believe in censoring my sister and I in terms of the movies that we watched within, within reason. Um, and my mom being a horror movie fanatic, she let us watch you know, all these horror movies. Um, my dad never really liked horror movies too much, but he sort of went along with it. I think the, the general rule in the house was if you or your sister have any nightmares, you're cut off. So um, I think, you know, we were so scared by movies as a kid, but we, we also knew they were kind of make-believe and it didn't really bother us in that way. So it, it was it was an unusual childhood. I knew there was lots of kids in my age who were not allowed to watch anything remotely close to what we were being allowed to watch. So, I mean, when you see other people like that, they think that, oh, that's going to warp a kid or that's going to make them grow up to be really weird. And, you know, I can't speak for other people, but like my sister and I turned out pretty much fine. And for me, it was just... Um, it was just the really fertile ground that my imagination was allowed to flourish in. You know, I just, I, I, I read all of this stuff. I, I was absorbed in, in horror novels and UFO documentaries. Um, and that just totally shaped who I was. And it, it really, you know, it, it totally led to my interest in, in uh, ufology and parapsychology, which in turn led to my, uh, my adult life as a, uh, as a uh, novelist and writer of, um, of horror fiction. What's your favorite topic to write about? I would say the one that I keep going back to over and over again is some species of horror. I say supernatural fiction. Horrors tends to have a lot of negative connotations towards people. They think gore, you know. Um, I'm not anti-gore by any stretch, but um, I'm more of the classic sort of Algernon Blackwood, um, Shirley Jackson, sort of more unsettling, you know, uh, you know, more creepy as opposed to going for the gross out. Um, 
Uh, I also write, you know, detective fiction. Uh, I've written westerns. I've written comedies. Uh, for me, it's it's sort of like my interest in, in books or the movies that I that I consume uh, as a as a reader and watcher. I like everything, so I'll watch anything as long as it has a good story. And when it comes to writing, I'll write anything as long as the story pops into my mind. So, if I came up with a great idea for like a 17th century romance tomorrow, um, I would never be like, "Ooh, I don't write that," and then not write it. If if the story compels me, if that's what my passion is uh, is driving towards, I'll write it. You know, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very open to uh, to where my imagination wants to go. It's I, I know a lot of people who who want to write or they want to pursue something, but they don't have that passion. Um, and I think that's the one thing that you can't really teach anyone. You can teach people to write, you can teach them to dance, you can teach them to play hockey, but you can't teach passion, whether it's it's there or it's not. So for me, um, as I've grown older, I'm going to be 45 this year, and I've been publishing professionally for about 15 years now. Um, I try to go where my passion is. That's, you know, when they say trust your gut, um, I trust my passion. Um, I write the stories that, um, that interest me. You know, I think it was Good Elmore, the crime novelist who said um, he writes the books that are, that, um, that he wants to read, you know, you, you keep it interesting, you keep it fun. You know, I, I can honestly say that I have two books on the go. Mm-hmm. One is with all this weird and strange crap that is, that is, been haunting me for the last number of years and one's just a little side project that I think would be really cool and I cannot believe you know coming from a journalism background how much I actually get writer's block on this where I will literally go for months and not touch anything and then I'll you know I'll go through about a, a three four five day stretch where it's like you know I'm up all night after the show you know hammering away on the keyboard because I want to get this out and then I stop for like another two, three, four months. It drives me crazy, to be absolutely honest. I can actually tell you why that is. I literally had that conversation with my wife who works in communications. Please. And myself, I also have a journalistic background. And I was talking to her just today about this short story that I've been sort of chipping away at the last couple of weeks. And I was really frustrated because I know the whole story, um, but I can't focus. It's uh, The passion is there. But for some reason, whether it's the, the pandemic brain fog has finally caught up with me, or I'm just um, in a distracted state of mind. I don't know what it is. And she said, you've got the background, you, you've you got the skills um, and the passion, but you don't have a deadline. And that's a journalistic background is great. But unless you actually have someone who says, I need this Monday morning at nine o'clock, you'll just chip away at it or you won't do it at all. So um, I think that's what it is. You know, like unless I have a firm deadline from my agent or a publisher, um, I'll just do it when I feel like it. Because the passion right. is great. The passion wants to work, but the passion doesn't always show up at eight o'clock every morning. <laughs> Don't you know? I know the one book that I'm writing. You know that I just kind of started on. And I've got a good base for it so far. Uh, I had that. I got woken up at three o'clock in the morning with mm-hmm. that, and I couldn't get back to sleep because I had to write everything down. Mm-hmm. And I was like, "This has never happened to me ever mm-hmm. in my life." And so, you know, one day I'll get to it once all these little knickknack projects are, are uh, out of the way, which I, which everybody always says, Mm -hmm. you know, but one day, I, one day I want to be like you and have a a couple of books, you know, one day, one day, Ian Rogers is with us tonight. Ian, you know, 12 years old, you're investigating UFOs. We're going to get more into that when we come back for the break at the bottom of the hour in, in about 10, 11 minutes here. But, you know, what do you think of the UFO topic, especially these days? Well, you know, I sort of keep a toe in with ufology these days. And um, I mean, it took me a little while when I, when I first sort of uh, got back into it. I was like, what's a UAP? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even know what that was. You know, it shows uh, how long I'd been away. Um, for me, it was um, obviously there are still sightings because there's always sightings. But what I really noticed was that there hadn't really been like a big case in a long time. You know, there hadn't been a... Uh, uh, a Roswell or a Bent Waters or a, or a Guardian, you know. I, I think the closest I had seen in the last five to ten years was the uh, the so-called Roswell slides. And I think even before they were revealed as the the hoaxes that they are, I don't I don't think anyone really thought they were going to turn out to be anything. Um, but again, it was the it was the case that people were talking about. Versus, uh, here's another um, video of something that. You know, now with the with the advent of drones and and Photoshop technology that you can do right on your own phone, it's just so easy to to fake anything these days that 
I'm not as compelled by video or much less photo evidence as I would have been maybe back in the nineties, you know? So uh, I, I don't dismiss it. I think, Hey, that's, that's really cool. Or, Hey, that's, that's really creepy. But I mean, it's just, it's hard to really take it as proof of anything. If that's, if that's really all you have, just because of how easily it can be, uh, it can be forged or hoaxed, you know, it's uh, so for me, it was just, um, it was nice to see that the field was still there, was still going strong, and that a lot of the players that I knew back in the 90s were still around and kicking, a lot of them blogging these days, which there there wasn't any of in the 90s. Um, but yeah, I think it was just, um, it, it was hard to really, for me to get back involved in any major way, just because it just seemed sort of uh, scattered. You know, I, it was just, you know, the Navy was going to make some big report about UFOs one day, but they keep moving the goalposts. Um, you know, this president or this leader says they're going to reveal these files about Area 51 or whatever. So it was just it was sort of like, uh, you know, Bob Dylan, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And um, so in that way, a, a lot of it had just hadn't really changed. You know, there, there wasn't really a case that was really being held up as the pinnacle of here. We got some physical evidence here and this is the one. This is the one, you know, it's the uh, it's the um, it's the one that's going to prove everything. It's one that's going to knock down all the walls. So. But I mean, the fact that I'm still interested and I'm still looking, um, I think, sort of speaks to my uh, my Fox Mulder nature. You know, I, uh, I still want to believe, you know, even after all this time when when uh, it's nice, though, I think, uh, especially with the uh, the past year that we've had with uh, COVID-19. I think it's important to believe in something, if you know anything, frankly. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, I, I am getting absolutely sick and tired of uh being stranded you know i'm almost starting to feel claustrophobic over it all i really mm -hmm. am and uh i don't know whether you know like i'm an introvert so the whole pandemic thing really hasn't bugged me but mm -hmm. i think what's what's really bugging me and is totally off topic is just the way people are treating people yeah that's yeah. that's what i cannot handle is the way right. i see people treating people and and yeah. i think it's horrible i think um I think it really is sort of like an acid test where we've been put through this really horrible thing, like a pandemic. It doesn't get much worse than that. It's literally, a, it's right there in the name. It's, it's affects the entire world. And if you ever needed a bigger message that we're all in this together, it's, it's a pandemic. And it, it, for me, when, whenever you see people being really nasty to each other, or even just really, you know, a vitriolic on the internet about anything, you know, a movie they didn't like or, or something more serious, I always just think it comes down to a lack of empathy. You know, you just, you don't really see, you know, people really caring about each other. And it sound, it's too bad that oh, that sounds like such a, a kumbaya kind of a moment because it's not really what I'm saying. It's just having, taking a breath and, and being able to really put yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, I think is the, I mean, what, what do they tell you when you have, when you have anger, you know, oh, take, you know, cool out, you know, take a breath, you know, count to three. Um, I think you need to do the same thing to really feel sort of empathy towards other people. And I think um, the pandemic has really shined a light on that where you've seen, uh, you know, obviously frontline workers, but all kinds of other people who aren't frontline workers really stepping forward and trying to make the most of this really exemplifying the fact that we are all in this together and other people who are, taking the exact opposite approach. So it's, it's really made things kind of black and white in a lot of ways, which is, is, is kind of startling, um, startling good and startling bad. I prefer to focus on the good and, and, and boost those more positive stories. Um, like you, I'm also an introvert. Um, I, I've been a full-time writer for four years. So the pandemic lockdowns and everything hasn't really changed a lot for me. Um, uh, yeah. I, I feel ripped off to be honest. I do. <laughs> You, I could I could say that I've been training for this my whole life. So yes. what I do is try and help other people. I help my wife who's not used to working at home. She's not used to not seeing her family or seeing her friends, you know. So I try to be almost like a pandemic counselor for the people who who are having a hard time dealing, you know. Yeah. You know, you know what this makes me think of is we got about five and a half minutes, and I'm curious to get your opinion. With the way you've seen people treat people through the pandemic, whether it's hoarding toilet paper, hoarding hand sanitizer, hoarding milk, you know, where you see somebody with 10 jugs of milk and they won't give one up to a, to a single parent, you mm -hmm. know, who's carrying a baby or, or whatever it may be, you know, it just, it baffles my mind. Could you, mm -hmm. how do you think they're going to react or society is going to react if aliens are actually known to be coming to this planet? 
Well, you know, I mean, I mean, there's been so many cases. I mean, there, I remember back in the 70s. I don't remember. I was a child in the 70s, but I remember when Close Encounters of the Third Kind came out and there was a lot of talk like there is with any kind of a big tentpole alien movie that, oh, this movie was all it's all part of the plan. It's all part of it to get us ready for the, the big alien truth. They said the same thing about Independence Day 20 years later. Um, you know, Hollywood is working with the government. Um, and I mean, you got you, you couldn't have two more different movies. You know, here's the aliens. They're here, you know, bringing peace. And here's the aliens. They're here, you know, bringing war and they're going to pillage our planet. Um, for me, it's like I would normally before the pandemic, I would say, well, I would like to be I think it's the thing that unites us because that's what the movies teach us. Even the movies about war. That's what they teach us. Like there's going to be a fight, but we're going to fight together against the, the alien menace. Um, after COVID-19, where we're up against. Um, yeah, like a virus, you know, like a, like a, a, you know, a coronavirus, which we knew, we knew what they are, we knew they were coming, we knew this was going to happen. And the way to combat it um, is by, you know, like you said, it's just social distancing, face masks and empathy, you know, and we can't even do that. Uh, I, I read an article with, uh, it was, it was um, a virologist or someone was saying that um, they were just glad that this was a, a respiratory illness and not like a, a flesh eating uh, um disease um if this was sort of like uh, something that could travel through the air or or something that was that that was uh, a lot more serious than a respiratory thing we would have seen m much more death than we are seeing already and we're already seeing plenty of it but it's there's some people that are like oh it's only got the one percent fatality rate it's not a big deal it's just the flu um so i don't think people realize how awful this is and yet how lucky we were that it wasn't a mutated version of another type of virus. So, but again, humans uh, were kind of like, uh, as a species, we were kind of like the, the Monday morning quarterbacks, you know, unfortunately um, there is no Monday morning after a pandemic sweeps through you, you know, if you don't do the right things, you know, it can, you don't get to take some of these things back. There's no color commentary when there's no one to hear it. So um it does make me sad, but at the end of the day, I'm an optimist. Um, uh, I was raised by good people. I, I married a good woman. Um, I've got good friends. Um, so if you can't, if you're worried about the mobs or you don't believe, so you, you believe in the people that are around you, you know, like you, if you believe in enough of them and they believe in you, it starts to connect. And again, I, I feel like I'm going back into sort of kumbaya territory here, but you know what? I'll take it right now, frankly, you know, things have been so downbeat for the past year. Um, and as I said, there's a lot of people that have not even been able to take just even being at home. And I get that, you know, a lot of people aren't, aren't like us. You know, they, they can't, they're not introverts. They're not used to this sort of a lifestyle. So if I can help them in some way, if I can distract them in some way, um, I think, I think just a little kindness and a little empathy just goes a long way. Well, you know what? It's going to be interesting because of everything that's going on with all the talk about UFOs and whether or not we are alone in the universe, if it comes down to the fact that there is a date set, the aliens are on their way, mm -hmm. I'm telling you, mankind, humankind, whatever you want to call it, whatever the politically correct answer is to that today, I will say this, we are not ready. Many mm -hmm. people believe we are, but hey, we got a bird's eye view right now in real time of what happens when crap hits the fan here on this planet. And mm -hmm. it isn't a pretty, pretty picture. That's that's what I will say about it. But anyways, let's get back to UFOs here because we're going to go to break in about a minute. And you started investigating UFOs at the age of 12. And then it turned into this whole UFO town, which became a CBC documentary. For people who don't know what the CBC is, it's a Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. How did, how did it feel to have that splattered all over television at such a young age? Well, you know, it's, I was not splattered over TV at the young age. It was, my interest was definitely there. It was, it was really more me seeing it on TV and seeing one of these big UFO cases on major American network TV. That's just taking place a couple hours from my house. You know, it just, it just never happens. Like you said yourself, like we're, we're not really known for our, our stories up here. You know, you take away you know, when to go on Bigfoot, there's not a lot left in terms of where are the Canadian monsters, where are the Canadian UFO cases? Um, you know, you take away, you know, you got Shag Harbor, you got Falcon Lake, and you got Guardian, you know, Guardian is, is such an odd case. Um, and the fact that it was so near to where I lived, and at the perfect time in my life for me to, or what I felt was the perfect time for me to really sink my teeth in and sort of uh, show my, uh, 
my, my interest and my chops as, a, as an investigator and, and to prove something, of course, when you're sure. that young, you feel like you have to prove something. Sure. Um, I'm going to get you to hold on right perfect. there because we're going to talk about Guardian and proving yourself when we come back. Ian Rogers is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Yeah, you can find any of his books at major bookstores, online and Amazon, everywhere that they sell books. That's where you can find Ian's. We highly recommend that you do. We'll be back with more Spaced Out Radio right after this. All right, we're clear. Awesome. That was a quick half hour. Yeah, how was that? Was that sound okay? Oh, yeah. So just so you know, the YouTube audience can hear us. They kind of get the behind the scenes of everything. No, it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of cool. No, that was a fast first half hour, man. That's what I like. Well, I should have warned you that I talk a lot. So one of the also one of the other side effects of uh, being at home with my wife for uh, for the past year is she is so happy that I can talk to someone else that's not her. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh well, hey, whatever happens, happens. You can talk to me, my friend. You can talk <laughs> to me. I don't mind. I'm here. Yep. No, I've. Uh... I've definitely been uh, reaching out to the writers that I know. It's funny because writers, but well, I mean, by our very nature, we're solitary people. So, uh, but you know, there's, there's a few that I Skype with uh, once or twice a year. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just really trying to reinforce those connections. Um, that was another thing with this, this story that's sort of kicking my ass right now. Um, I just feel like, I really do feel like the, like the brain fog that people talk about from just being at home and dealing with this for the years, finally catching up with me. Whereas like a year I was fine. Nothing's bothered me, but for the past week or so, it's like, I'm forgetting names or I'm just distracted while I'm working. I might go off and I start surfing the net or I do something else. It's just, those distractions were always there. And sometimes they would, you'd go down those rabbit holes, but lately it's just like, I feel like a grasshopper. I just can't focus on, on anything, you know, it's really weird. Oh, very true very very true i'm having a tough time focusing right now because you know the ufo world is moving so quickly right now with everything Mm -hmm. i mean just trying to catch up is just brutal especially like i I moonlight doing this i have a full-time daytime job Mm -hmm. you know and like today i was supposed to get some projects done for a, a virtual conference didn't even get to them today right you know i i was too busy doing doing other stuff that i needed to get done and it's like damn it and in the meantime you still got to fold laundry you still got to make the bed you still got to do dishes make dinner you know pick up the kid from school and you're like meantime you still got to fold sorry yeah (laughs) the uh, youtube chat there i was gonna see uh that's where the chat is right yes so just make sure you mute the tab yeah i got it on uh perfect there you go yeah yeah yeah, and if uh, I'll try and keep track of it too, but if anyone has any questions, well, you said sorry, the second hour. Yeah, yeah. second hour we'll take questions, and uh, and uh, what we will do that is I'll ask them from the audience. They'll be in uh, capital letters, and then on the screen here you'll watch it. I'll pop up the question there. Okay. Yeah, we're high tech around here. <laughs> well, I knew that I'd used Streamyard before. I just uh, couldn't really remember because, of course, obviously the person that I was uh, using it with has a uh, was doing all the work so i was just sort of <laughs> making sure that uh you know i was looking at the camera and wasn't you know there was no cat wandering on screen as he sometimes does <laughs> see that's my problem is being in radio for so long not having to stare at a camera all of a sudden i'm like wow because mm. my eyes are always moving and shifting and i'm like my goodness people must absolutely hate me absolutely well, hate me I've seen every single background you can imagine and having stepped in on many of my wife's uh, um, Zoom uh, meetings with uh, with all of her people at the university where she works, I mean, you got nothing to feel bad about. There's people who've got nothing in the background. There's people who've got like garbage and kids and it's just, just like it's pandemonium in the background. So it's like for me, it's as long as I'm wearing a shirt and, you know, like you know, there's it's my background's using me books and cat toys, you know, it's uh I did make sure to clear it up a little bit, but, uh, that's again. okay. That's okay. I'm just, I think we're all jealous of the bookshelves. I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, lie over that. <laughs> well, I would wish I could give you a full tour because a lot of these are signed and a lot of them have got a pretty good, uh, story behind them. I got a really, uh, 
I got a great um, signed copy of uh, Chuck P's uh, Fight Club. And uh, there's a really funny story about how I got it um, when he came to Toronto to do a signing. If you uh, want to ask me that sometime, I'll give you the uh, the Coles Notes version. It's actually pretty amusing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely, man. Uh, we have about uh, one minute left, just over okay. one minute here. And um, yeah. We get to hang out. Big thank you to FAP for kicking off the super chat tonight. We really do appreciate that. Hey, FAP, I actually found a brand new hat that fits my head. I bet you're jealous because you haven't worn a hat in about, you know, 15 years, (laughs) you know, because they don't make size 28s. Anyways, uh, big thank you, FAP, for everything you do to support this show. I love you, man. And uh, yeah. Good way to support. Uh, hit that super chat if you're new. Do us a favor. Hit that subscribe button. We are not a podcast. We are a live radio show. So that's why we take the breaks. And here we go with the second half hour right now. second half hour of spaced out radio is now underway my name is dave scott thank you so much for taking the time to join us we really do appreciate earning your listening ears we want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio just do old davy the favor hit that subscribe button our website is spaced where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our guest tonight, Ian Rogers, is here. He's a Canadian author talking about all things Weird and Strange's website, ian-rogers.com. If you want to check it on out, all of his books are there as well. Ian, thank you so much for joining us. And right before the break, you were you were starting to tell us a little story about how you got involved with everything and what piqued your interest, you know, as we started going down the UFO road. You know, it's like I said, I was being raised on this steady diet of, you know, UFO stories, documentaries, uh, true crime stuff like uh, Unsolved Mysteries. I mean, that was the thing that really brought me into it, I think, was uh, Unsolved Mysteries was such a classic TV show. I mean, hosted by the legendary Robert Stack. I mean, you could not have... It was the perfect show at the perfect time. You got the true crime element, but they would also do stuff about ghost stories and UFOs. And they treated it with the same respect and integrity. You know, like these are things they didn't make fun of any of it. And the dramatizations were always incredible. So for me, it was seeing that episode um, about the Guardian case um, and realizing that not only is there a case that took place in Canada, but it took place you know just a couple of hours from from where I live. And, and if you know anything about the Guardian case, it's a spooky case, you know, I mean, you, you, there's really nothing like it in, in the UFO lore. You've got this mysterious individual who calls himself Guardian shooting these tapes of um, allegedly landed UFOs and, and sending them anonymously to investigators around the world. You know, it's uh, it's like a movie, you know, that's that's what I what I, what I keep saying was um, for me as a movie lover, it, it was it was one thing to be a fan and be a big trivia buff. I mean, in high school, I worked in a video store. That's what I did. I was the video. I was the movie guy. You know, like I knew everything about movies. I was a film junkie. And then to watch an episode of this TV show that um, that just, you know, shot up the fires of my interest in UFOs and, and unexplained phenomenon and it was like, you could be in this movie now, this thing that's like a movie, you could be a character in this. So this is a real mystery and you could, you could help solve it. And, you know, I had to try, you know, I had, I had to be involved, you know. I got to ask you about Robert Stack for a second. Mm-hmm. You know, when he started talking, didn't his voice just give you the shivers, like the creepy shivers, like, oh, we're going to get into some good stuff tonight. Mm-hmm. Well, he knew, I mean, that that show was so calculated. It was, mm-hmm. it, it was so, I mean, obviously Robert Stack famous from the untouchables. He's wearing the outfit that he used to wear on that show. I mean, he's, he's, he looks like an FBI agent when you see, you know, Mulder on the X-Files or, or agent Cooper in twin peaks. I mean, that's the, like the, the, the trench coat, you know, the overcoat that he's wearing there, the, the integrity, it was the music of the show, the theme of the show. And then Robert Stack stepping out of the shadows. It's, 
I mean, it was just something that really had an impact on me as a kid. You know, even now I've been rewatching some of the old episodes. I think they're all up on uh, Prime or YouTube or something. But uh, they they hold up, man. I mean, they're still creepy. I'm in my 40s and they're still scary. (laughs) I know the feeling. I know the feeling. I remember being, you know, waiting for that intro of Unsolved Mysteries and just praying there was something on Bigfoot or UFOs or ghosts. And it's like, Unsolved Missing Case, Unsolved Missing Case man disappears woman disappears and you're like no this is not why i'm tuning in give me the woo man give me the woo my sister used to always uh, freak out whenever uh, the updates would come up we'd be like oh my gosh there's an answer to one of the mysteries you know like it was never the ghost it was always like some fugitive it was i mean the show was almost a precursor to america's most wanted um so i mean a lot of the updates were mostly the criminal cases but my sister and i we would always just be there with our fingers crossed are there gonna be any updates tonight on on uh, bigfoot or area 51 there never was but uh it's uh oh i hear you I hear you. So take us back to UFO town. All mm-hmm. right. You're 12 years old. You start investigating and the guardian case mm-hmm. what, for many of us, even myself included, we're not very familiar with this case and hard to find information on it. Yeah. Well, I can, uh, I can break it down for you fairly quickly. Um, back in 1989, um, UFO investigators in Canada and the United States um, began receiving packages of information. Um, it was really, the, the first packages were nothing. It was like a two-page report of a UFO c- crash retrieval in the uh, swamps of eastern Ontario, sort of outside Ottawa. And um, with this report, there was a um, like a photocopy picture of what was supposed to be like a gray-style alien. Um, all you could really see was like a white face with the almond-shaped eyes and what looked like a field. It really looked like someone wearing a mask, frankly. It was um, even from the angle, it wasn't it wasn't even a great angle because it really looked like it showed the strap of the mask. Um, as such, I mean, the investigators didn't really think much of it, this material that was coming from this person who called himself Guardian. So um, I believe that they did send an investigator up to that, to the area where it was supposed to have happened, which was Carp, um, uh, Corkery, uh, that area um, near um, Almont, Carlton Place. Um, and I think that there was a couple of people who said that they saw like a bright light out in one of the swamps, but that was really it. There was, there was nothing to investigate. There was nothing to follow up and um, people just forgot about it for a couple of years. And then in 1991, um, Guardian started sending out more material, um, more documents about crash retrievals. Um, these documents purported to be um, government documents from the department of national defense. But I mean, if you've ever seen them, I mean, they're 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 poor forgeries i mean they're uh, i mean a six-year-old kid could do better they they look really really sloppy there there's misspellings all over the place um more photographs of aliens that look like someone wearing a hockey mask in a field and and i know because me and my friend of mine faked photos like that to show how easy it was to, to do the guardian alien pictures um so again i mean people weren't really thinking very much of it and they probably would have just dismissed it as more of a guardian up to his old tricks but this time he includes a tape videotape and it's uh got a label on it that says guardian and there's a thumbprint on the tape and the tape's about um 20 minutes maybe 30 minutes long and it's three or four scenes um edited um of a brightly lit craft on the ground um at night you can't see any other details except for these bright floodlights sort of things next to um four um, red flares uh, burning on the ground. And at the end of the tape are a series of still images of the same um, sort of a, a luminescent um, gray type alien figure where all you can really make out is this white head and the hands. You can't even see anything else. Everything else is just all dark. Um, almost like what I look like here on the on the YouTube video. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, uh, it, it was a lot more material uh, than Guardian had ever sent before. And he had sent it to a lot more people. And what was really interesting to know with the Guardian tape itself was some people got different cuts. Some people got seven minutes. Some people got the full 20 or 30. Um, there was an investigator in the United States, Bob Exler. I think he got the full version, but there was no audio track on his on his copy, whereas other people had audio where you could hear like a barking dog in some of the, uh, the segments. So again, it was um, it wasn't that people were really starting to take Guardian seriously. But it it was more of the fact that he had just given more to investigate. I I think the the documents were kind of as ridiculous, even if not more ridiculous, than the 89 documents. 
um, and easily um, as dismissive, but you've got this tape and the tape is quite compelling. It is quite spooky. And he's also included a map of where this encounter, this retrieval um, allegedly took place. So I think that it was just one of these things where um, enough people had got the tape. It's happening kind of in their backyard. Yeah, it's probably nothing, but let's go check it out anyway. So um, this would have been 1992 is when the tapes started going out. And it was May of that year that um, uh, Canadian investigators from UFON Ontario and QFORN um, went up to the um, CARP um, uh, Corkery area with um, an American investigator named Bob Exler, um, who I said was also one of the um, recipients of the Guardian material. And they went up and they went into the swamps to try and figure out, uh, you know, based on this map that Guardian had sent, where this UFO had had landed. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you want to keep going with the story. It's just like keep going, man. Keep going. Man. I'm I'm thrilled by this. The the Canadians were just, I mean, like they'd been getting stuff from Guardian since since '89. Um, this was new for Bob, and Bob was really quite interested. But the Canadians were pretty much like, this is probably a hoax. Um, the other stuff was was a hoax. No one's really seen anything. Um, but Bob was adamant. You know, he's like, you know, I'm going into the swamp. He was there with his son. Um, he brought his son up. And the Canadians were like, well, we're going to go get something to drink. They just left. It was just this was like hot. It was it was May. It was mosquito weather in the swamps of. Uh, of Eastern Ontario. So they, uh, they left and a few of them are really kind of questioning Bob's motives. Um, uh, I, I think because of his previous um, uh, experience in terms of um, trying to validate the Gulf breeze stuff, um, cases like that, which sort of sank his career. There, there's a lot of people that were saying that he was kind of on the outs since he was sort of clinging to the guardian case as this is going to be the thing that, that redeems me. So they were just jokingly saying, Oh yeah, you know, uh, you know, Bob's going to come back in half an hour and tell us that he found the, the landing site. You know, they, they sort of laugh. And then sure enough, you know, while they're at this restaurant uh, having something to drink, Bob shows up and says, um, I found it. You know, I found where the UFO landed. And so, again, it was just, it was just another reason why the Canadians were uh, were very skeptical of uh, of what he was doing. And uh, there was even some that felt like he he already knew his way around the area, like he'd already been there before. Um it was just it was it was very dodgy right from uh, right from jump street with uh with with, with bob there's a lot of people that were really questioning his motives um he seemed to have a narrative in mind and he was sort of uh just looking for the facts to sort of fit the story that he was already kind of piecing together and I, that just really rubbed a lot of the canadians the wrong way so a lot of the canadian investigators sort of fell off the investigation right from that point they had already figured it was a hoax and they did not like the way um Bob was operating. So they just, they just pulled out. There was only a, a handful of people um, who are still willing to, uh, to stick with it, you know, while Bob was you know, trying to investigate, uh, track down witnesses. Um, and the thing is that there was UFO activity in that area, in, in the um, West Carlton area in that time from, I would say about 88 to 92, 94. Um, it had been reported in the media even before the guardian case kind of swept in. Um, so the thing with Bob, though, was that when he would meet someone, he would try and say, well, how is this going to connect to the Guardian tape? How can I? He was looking for witnesses for the event because it was going to it would help, you know, support his 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 story, you know, that he wanted to sell. And he had an ownership of the case. This was his case. Um, we you see him on uh, on Unsolved Mysteries. You see him on sightings and counters. Um, he was very um, protective of this case. He and then he and then he monetized it. You know, he was actually selling the Guardian case, the, sorry, the Guardian tape, out of uh, UFO magazines for like thirty bucks plus shipping. <laughs> you know, it was just, it, it was hard not to think that he didn't have a uh, a monetary uh, uh, motive to uh, to make the Guardian case real. You know, and and he had the media contacts. You know, we'll give him that. You know, he'd been on TV. Um, he was able to get Unsolved Mysteries up there. And, and the idea was to use this program to try to flush Guardian out because um, because the Unsolved Mysteries show has a tip line. You know, if you know anything about this case, you call the tip line. So someone did when when the show was up there filming. And this would have been 93. Um, some it was all like this is small town Ontario. Right. So like an American TV crew up here, you know, filming stuff for this major program. 
it's big news, you know, like everyone's all interested in stuff. So lots of people call the tip line, not even before the show's aired. This is while they're filming, you know, in the fall. The the, the show aired, I think, in uh, January, February of 94. So this would have been um, fall um, 93. So people are already coming out saying, oh, I've seen stuff. Um, one person comes out and says, I know who Guardian is. There's a guy here in town. He's obsessed with UFOs. Everyone knows him as the UFO guy. And he's called himself Guardian in the past. So, I mean, as far as tips go, I mean, that's, uh, that's all the pretty compelling evidence. So, um, so Bob and uh, the, the, the Canadian investigators who were still sticking with the case, um, they try to, um, to contact this person. And this guy doesn't want to have anything to do with them. He doesn't want to talk to them. He won't answer his door. But won't even, you know, not even to say, I'm not guardian, you know, leave me alone, you know, um, which of course only makes them more suspicious of him, um, which is something that sort of comes full circle with UFO Town, this documentary that was made almost 30 years later. Um, one of the things I liked about the documentary was that if you watch the Unsolved Mysteries segment, um, which again, uh, as you can, you can watch it on Prime, it's still up there. It's I think you even see the segment itself is on YouTube. It's like it's like nine minutes long, twelve minutes long, but it ends on this note where no one knows who Guardian is. Uh, um, the encounters segment, um, the sightings, they sort of just rehash the same story. You never really get you only you don't even get half the story. You get maybe a quarter of the story. UFO Town, you get the whole story. You know, it was it maybe it took 30 years to to get that story. But this was where um, this was part of the reason why they contacted me was um, I wasn't really working with um, Mufon on Terror and I wasn't really working with Bob Exler, but I had worked with them both at one time. I was I sort of had this eagle eyes view of, of the entire case. You know, I, I knew the whole story. And um, that was, I think, one of the main reasons why the uh, the producers of, of UFO Town were interested in speaking with me was there wasn't a lot of people who who were around who who, who knew the whole story and were willing to talk about it. Even just in 2020 itself, I mean, one of the lead Canadian investigators passed away and Bob Exler died in the same year. So it's um, it's kind of weird and a little bit creepy that they both died in the same year that the documentary was filmed. These two people who almost certainly could have been part of that documentary. One of them definitely was was supposed to be you know, uh, was supposed to film an interview for it. So it's more than ever, it was, it said to me um, as a relatively young man that uh, this story needs to be told while I can still tell it. Um, it's, it's just such a weird story. You know, I, I'm still firmly believe that the Guardian case itself is a hoax, but there was definitely something happening in that area of West Carlton between 88 and, and 94. Um, the Guardian case itself though is so, it's a perfect scientific record. I mean, you, you don't look at it and say, oh, it's a hoax, you know, like that's too bad. And then just dismiss, dismiss, dismiss it or you don't care about it. It should be studied, you know. And that was one of the things I loved about UFO Town was they weren't trying to convince anyone about this. Um, they weren't trying to say, well, maybe it was ends or maybe it was this. It was the fact that um, it was more, there weren't certain like the sociology of belief. Why do people believe the things they do? What was happening in this area at this time? Even if this was, was, was maybe not real, maybe this, maybe there was still something actually happening there. Um, and that's the part that I felt, com uh, I felt was really compelling. I did not want to take part in something that was like a sens sensationalistic Fox news, sort of a, you know, it's guardian and it's definitely aliens, or it could be aliens when, when I did not feel that way, you know, I did not want to participate in something sensational. Um, but the fact that this was going to air on the CBC told me that it was going to be, uh, you know, uh, not like that, you know, not, not sort of like, um, clickbaity, um, just trying to go for the ratings, um. And it wasn't, you know, it was it, it was really respectful of the material. Um, it was respectful of my of my stance on it, and a lot of people's stance on it. Anyone who knows the, this business, um, if you talk to anyone like uh, Chris Rutkowski or any of the really serious investigators who have been in this for a long time, they just they know that Guardian is just it's it's a hoax, you know. Um, but that doesn't mean that other people who saw things in that area at that time um, uh, didn't see a legitimate phenomenon. Um, that's the problem with Guardian. Guardian kind of um, salted the earth for that. You know, it just he kind of ruined it for, for, for what could have been legitimate investigation. And um, I think that for me is the, the most unfortunate thing of the case is um, I'm glad that it got to be told. I'm glad that UFO Town exists um, for, for that reason. But I just wish that there could have been more focus on things that other people were seeing at that time. I think Guardian and the 
the cool factor of this mysterious person shooting these tapes kind of overshadowed what could have been a really cool investigation, you know, and into some really legit sightings, you know. There's a lot of criticism online about this story that it was fake. It was all hoaxed. It was all kind of, you know, brought to the forefront to play with the media, to play with people who were chasing around these aliens. You know, do you buy that this was a hoax? I buy that the Guardian tape and the documents are a hoax. I actually don't believe that the person, the, the Guardian suspect, um, was Guardian. Um, he was um, uh, tracked down. You know, we, you know, he was spoken to for, for the documentary. And um, I think just because his name was out there for, for, a long, for a long time, and because he never really said that he, he didn't, uh, he wasn't Guardian, um, I think it was just a lot of circumstantial evidence. And I think that when you actually speak to him, if you actually know the circumstances of, uh, of this person in his life, you realize that, um, that it wasn't him, you know, it's, it could, that it couldn't, couldn't have been him. So for me, I mean, it's a bit frustrating because then, well, then who, who was guardian actually, I think I've got a pretty good idea afterwards because there was a pool of suspects. Again, nothing that's really mentioned in any of the documentaries because you're dealing with privacy issues. You just can't start accusing people. And it's certainly not my interest to, um, to uh, make anyone's life miserable over a UFO hoax. That's not really hurting anybody, you know? So um, it's, um, you know, maybe it's the Canadian in me, you know, I'm just, I'm just too polite. (laughs) Really? (laughs) I'm sorry that you had to say that. How about, you know, I could take it down that road too, you know, (laughs) but, but seriously though, when it comes to everything, that's a hoax, every story has a hoax or not. You Mm -hmm. know, did Bob Lazar work at Area 51? Did he not? You got the Mm -hmm. pros and the cons, everybody taking sides. You got Mm -hmm. the people who believe that Lou Elizondo now is, you know, just a disinfo agent on UFOs, but the other side saying he is our UFO Jesus. You Mm -hmm. know, you have all of these people down the road who are either going to be UFOlogy's greatest... uh, you know, ambassador and those that don't believe them. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to say in any case what it is or if there is fakery or forgery going on. Well, you have to ask yourself, I mean, like what constitutes proof and what, what, what convinces one person and is not going to convince someone else. Right. It's, and ultimately people will believe what they want to believe. Bob Lazar is a very great case, but it's also very simple. He says he works at area 51 other people say that he hasn't. That's that's the story. You know, I worked there. I worked on UFOs, on, on reverse engineered UFOs. Skeptics say, no, you didn't. So he says, well, he's compelling because Bob has a science background. So he speaks very eloquently. He knows science. So you're more inclined to believe him that maybe he did do these things. Um, Bob is also very upfront by saying he has literally no proof. You know, he has... Um, he has a, I think there's like a pay, uh, a pay receipt that he got from like the Navy that says they worked there. But of course, the documents can easily be faked. And of course, um, as, as proof that you still worked on, on UFOs, uh, a piece of, uh, of government, you know, a government receipt is not really compelling evidence, but it's a good story. You know, like, I mean, for me, it's just, uh, I'm skeptical too. I mean, I think it's, um, it's really easy to believe because belief doesn't really ask anything from you. It's just to say, oh yeah, I believe that, you know, I believe these things are happening. Um, this is the reason why um, belief also works in, in religion. You know, it's just, it's, we, we look at, at ufology as, as a science and religion as this very different thing, but they're both wrapped up in belief. You know, it's actually, uh, it's quite an interesting subject, but it can also be very frustrating when you're trying to come up with something definite about those things, whether it's religion or, or, or UFOs, you know, someone sees a light in the sky and it's doing something very weird and they're convinced that it can't be an aircraft, you know, it must be aliens, you know, and I know what a UFO, I know what an airplane looks like. This isn't an airplane and there's nothing you can say that's going to change my mind. Like, what can you, what can you do with someone like that? Right. I mean, maybe they're right. You know, like they're, they're, they're saying something based on their own personal experience and it's not up to me to tell them they did not have that experience. You very, know, like, very true. And, and, you know, as a journalist and an experiencer myself, as we only got about 30 seconds, I could, I could say this. All right. Before you have an experience, or if you've never had an experience, it's never aliens. Mm-hmm. And once you have that ungodly experience where you see something that shouldn't exist Mm -hmm. and there it is right in front of your eyes 
it's always aliens, Ian. It is yep. always aliens. Ian, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. We are having one great conversation with a fantastic writer named Ian Rogers. He writes a lot of paranormal books and about ufology and other strange, weird topics. He's based out of the pride of Peterborough, Ontario. Yes, he is a Pete, everyone. He is a Pete. Now, I know our radio station in Mississauga and the Ice Dogs are not going to like that. It's probably going to cause a brawl in the OHL at one point. But nonetheless, we're going to see if Ian's Ian's got some aliens. We'll find out if he's got some ghosts as well. Coming up in Hour 2 of Spaced Out Radio. Take care. Stay soon. Stay soon. We'll see you soon. How about that? There we go. We'll be back. All right, my friend, I'm just going to run my dogs outside. I'll be right back, okay? All righty. All right. If you, if you, if you want to uh, talk with the crowd, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll leave your mic up. And okay. uh, you can, you're, you're watching. You can see their questions if they have anything for you. So that works too. I will keep an eye on it here, yeah. All right, man. Be right back. Okay. Hi, PBR. Hey, PBR. Lazar's a fake. Deal with it. Yeah, you know, it's compelling. I mean, I'm an evidence-based guy, so, I mean, it's uh, a receipt from the Navy. If it is a receipt from the Navy, it certainly isn't going to be enough to convince me that he worked there. So I, that's what I always say about Bob Lazar is I think because he can speak so um, eloquently about science, um, but so can a science teacher, you know. I mean, it just you're compelled to believe him because he sounds a lot more um, legitimate than just someone saying, I saw a UFO in a field, you know. Um so I understand why, why people believe in him. Um, and I think it's a cool story. Again, it's just, uh, it's, it's hard for me not to say that he did, maybe he did, he worked on something, but, uh, I don't know. It's hard for me to say that, especially in the, with the whole element 115 thing, which didn't exist back in 93. And now we've been able to, uh, duplicate it, fabricate it in, uh, lab conditions. So, I mean, it's, I don't know, uh, you need someone smarter than me with the science to be able to answer that one. But again, and t- until he comes out with, with more proof or, or there's someone else who can back up his claims, um, it's just a good story. You know, it's just a good story. Uh, where can you watch UFO Town in the U.S.? That's a very good question. I'm always asking the producer that. Um, it's a territories thing because it was produced for Canada, um, in Canada. Um, they can only show it in Canada for now. Um, I can tell you that there are they are working on um, rights issues and making sure that it'll be seen in the United States and abroad. So um, it's the question I'm asked all the time, and it's the question that I ask the producer all the time. So all I can st- say is uh, is stay tuned and believe me. Once it's available, I will be crowing it out through all of my social media platforms and all of the uh, the podcasts and radio shows I've done, like this one. Maybe I'll be on again if they want me on again. Um, I think it's going to find an even bigger audience. Um, uh, in the States because there's such a huge uh, market down there for uh, UFO stuff and uh, ghost stories, that sort of thing. I'm just looking at your questions here. How do you know that the element would be around in the future if it wasn't known at that time? I don't know that he knew that it was going to be around in the future. I mean, the elements are being discovered uh, constantly. I think, I mean, if you want to be a skeptic, you could say he just picked one further down the chart, hoping that he wouldn't have to deal with that at that time. Um, now they say that it's, it's a very unstable one. They can only produce it for very small amounts for a very small amount of period of time. And so he says that once you get the isotopes, I mean, you're getting into an area of science here that I'm not totally comfortable with, but I think he still has some, he still has a, a horse in that race where it could still be the element, uh, the fuel for, for the craft. I, I don't think that's been completely shot down just because element 115 has now been, uh, has been created or fabricated, whatever the, the word is. <laughs> Yeah, the idea that he saw too much and these things are compartmentalized. I've heard that too, uh, as, as someone who uh, whose family um, has worked in the military, the idea that one person would know all this stuff, because don't forget, Bob also says that he was given like the Bible of human interaction with the aliens for the past 20,000 years. Why would you give that to an engineer who's just there for a couple of months working on your your test aircraft? You know, so stuff like that, it, it's, it makes, it's a good story. 
but it for me it actually the skeptic in me says that yeah um he he reached too far you know he uh hmm. Stephen Boucher from Ontario you know what the name sounds familiar I'm not sure like I said I've been sort of uh soaking back into ufology these days um I'll have to look into that. I'm sure Google will help me. I am back. I hope they weren't too rough on you. No, we're just mostly talking Bob Lazar and. Uh... Oh yeah, PBR hates but Bob Lazar hates him. <laughs> hates him. I tried to watch the documentary, and um, I really wish they hadn't gotten Mickey Rourke to do the narration because uh, I love Mickey, but he's had better days, and the, uh, I can't really understand what he's. Saying no, through. I agree with you. <laughs> I can understand why they why they got him. Uh, theoretically <laughs> but but in practice it's like nope you gotta get someone else into the studio to record these lines so. i know i know i was talking to a buddy of mine who's very connected to hollywood and he's and he's like dude you wouldn't believe how many how many movie stars or musicians or famous people are experiencers oh yeah big time yeah well i was gonna say uh the Bob Lazar documentary was kind of a bust, but one that I did like, um, what's it called? I think it's called Mirage Men, the one about uh, Doty. Yes. Uh, I thought that was actually quite interesting because it doesn't really try to lionize him in any way. It, it was sort of like Project Beta, the book about Benowitz, and that's a creepy case. You want to see yeah. someone who lost their mind and, and was definitely taken advantage by, by someone, whether it was sanctioned or not by the, uh, the army. Um, that, that's a spooky case. And the book and the movie, they they don't lionize Doughty. Like he, they really grill him and say like, "You did this to this guy, you know. Like you did, you you literally drove him mad, you know." So uh, they don't let him off the hook for that one, which I uh, I really appreciate. All right, we are uh, up in about fifteen seconds. A big thank you to Dan W, Cat, and Fap for the amazing super chats that help really do uh, what we do on a nightly basis. Here we go, everyone, with hour two. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate earning your listening ears. We want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Decarnate. Decarnate is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Tonight we are talking UFOs, we are talking ghosts. Canadian writer Ian Rogers is here. You can find his books at any major bookstore in Canada, some in the United States, and online as well, his website, ian-rogers.com, where you can find his books as well. Ian, thank you so much for being here tonight. Hope you're having a good time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. I want to stick with the UFOs for just a little bit here, if you don't mind, you know, because we hear all of the stuff that's happening in the United States. It's Mm -hmm. weirding us out. You know, what is going on? What is happening? Uh, You know, we're only hearing the military side of everything. It's hitting the mainstream media. It's hitting the government. And one of the things that I want to know, and I've been asked about recently, you know, in interviews that I've done is, you know, here we have the Canadian uh, media who will play the UFO videos that are coming out of the United States, play all of the news, and not a single reporter will ask any politician in Ottawa or any member of parliament about what's Canada's role in ufology. Ufology. Do you not find this a little baffling? 
Yeah, it's one of these things that when you're when you're dealing with a bureaucracy, um, in my experience, I think it's a lot of people's experience that when they don't answer, it's either because they've got a they've got the biggest secret in the world they don't want you to know, or they don't have a clue and they don't want you to know that they don't have a clue. <laughs> you know, do you think Canada has some secrets that we need to uncover? I mean, we know about Shag Harbor. We know about Falcon Lake. I think us in ufology, we're all a little weirded out with the Canadian Mint made specialized coins over them. Mm-hmm. You know, but anything else to do with the topic, you know, we seem to, you know, just zip our mouths shut over it. What do you think about that? Well, I think the government's default um, action when it comes to something that they think is going to cause panic, mass panic or mass hysteria, is to cover it up. You know, they're, they're, the government feels like it's the parent of, 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 the, of the child, uh, child body of the population. So they think that they're protecting us. You know, they're, they're shielding us from these things. And let's face it, Canada is a big country. There's a lot of wilderness here. Our population density... Um, where we're spread to our urban centers, there could be stuff happening in all places, in all parts of Canada that the government is able, has the ability to sort of cover up. Um, and you just never know what happened. You know, I mean, we know about Shag Harbor. We know about Falcon Lake. Um, they've got names. They've got books. They've got movies that, that have been done, done about them. Um, what about the stuff that we've never even heard of? You know, it's just like there could be things that are happening, whereas uh, in a country like, say, like the United States, where you still have remote areas, um, but again, when you hear about crash retrievals, UFO crash retrieval stories, they almost always happen in remote areas, right? They always happen in a desert. These aliens are never crashing into a city or a town, right? It's always somewhere where the government can get in and get out, clean it up, cart the stuff off to Hangar 18 or whatever. Um, as countries become more industrialized, those stories um, start to become more more like fables, you know, this idea that they're only crashing in these remote areas. But in a country like Canada, I mean, that stuff could still happen. There's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that could happen out there in, those, in, in the, the Great White North, and, uh, and we never know about it, you know, or the water, you know, like the, the oceans make up 80% of the planet. All kinds of stuff could be happening out there or crashing there or taking place there. If I was the one controlling the UFO phenomenon, if there was a conspiracy, I wouldn't even be doing it on land. You know, do it all out in the ocean. Create some sort of a uh, a base or a platform out there. You know, remove it. You know, don't you don't, you don't need Area 51. You don't need um, these bases on, on land. You know, um, there are so many more places that are less accessible um, by by water would be uh, the way that I would do it if I, if I was the one in charge. <laughs> You know, and you're right. I mean, Canada, you know, for the landmass, I believe it's 1.2 million per square mile. Mm-hmm. Or, pardon me, uh, one, 1. 1.2 people for every square mile in mm-hmm. this country. Whereas you you take someplace like Hong Kong, where it's like 4,800 people per square mile. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. And you're right about that. You know, but it also makes me wonder, you know, about NORAD, the connection to NORAD, the connection to NATO, and everything along those lines. You know, we're just being the good Canadian kids, knowing that if we don't talk about it, it never existed. You mm-hmm. know, that's the way, I mean, if, if Canadian people actually knew how hard the military goes and fights when they are mm-hmm. overseas, we would never, ever be able to you know, let our military go anywhere. We mm-hmm. wouldn't. I mean, look what happened in Somalia when the mm-hmm. Canadian paratroopers were disbanded right after that. So, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things that uh, that come out about that. But when it comes to UFOs, I'm surprised we haven't had more fighter pilots, even going back to the days of flying the old CF-100 Canuck, that we are, you know, talking about this. Like, they are dead silent Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not really sure why. I mean, um, the 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 investigator, the scientist in me says, well, if they're not talking about it, there's no evidence there. That's that's the reason why they're not talking. But the 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 Mulder in me, the person who wants to believe, um, tries to look at it from the other way that maybe there is something and they're not allowed to talk, or maybe they're really loyal and it's they really believe in their their oath of secrecy, and they're not talking out of. Uh, you know, out of, out of, out of uh, loyalty to the country and to protect the people, which is why they usually get involved in, in the armed forces. You know, it's uh, my, my family has got a, a rich tradition of serving. My father was in the RCMP and my grandparents were, uh, were, were in the uh, armed forces. They were in World War uh, II. 
My grandmother was a cipher uh, clerk at uh, Canada House in London. Uh, my grandfather, Sheldon, and his two brothers, um, they took part in D-Day. Two of them landed at Juneau. One of them landed at Anzio. Um, they all came back alive. So, the, and they never spoke about it. You know, this was something that was taking place all over the world, you know, and it wasn't just uh, loyalty to the service. It was it was how traumatic uh, war war actually is that um, my grandfather never, never spoke about it. You know, so if you take it from that context and say, well, say you see a UFO and say you, um, if you're a fighter pilot, for example, um, would you talk about it? Would you be allowed to talk about it? Would you feel like you needed to reveal something if your superiors told you not to talk about it? It's so hard to say. I mean, it's um, that that loyalty um, is so ingrained, you know, uh, in, in these, in these officials, uh, in these soldiers, um, which you admire. I mean, you loose lips sink ships, right? I mean, the, the secrecy isn't just there to, to, uh, to frustrate people who want to know the public, you know, it, it is there for, for usually for a reason, sometimes not a good reason, but sometimes it is a good reason. It's, I really try and look at it from both ways and be like, well, you know, if, if I would, if I could blow the whistle on this and reveal the truth, you know, yeah, the answers will be out there, but is that necessarily the right thing to do? You know, like maybe, maybe it isn't, you know, it's just, I would hope that I would think about it before I would, before I would make that decision. I think, I think it's really, really, um, I don't want to say juvenile, but I think it's very simplistic just to say the public has the right to know everything you know, and everything's fine. So it's just like, yeah, I do believe that on the surface. I totally believe that. I think that that kind of secrecy is, is usually bad or, or it's, or it's deceptive or it's greedy. Um, but you know, if it's for the best, you know, the best for who, you know, like, is it going to hurt a lot of people? You know, if I do this, is this actually going to cause a lot of harm? It, it's, it's a, it's a big thing to do. It's a big action. You know, that's a, it's, it's a heavy stick to swing. And, um, I don't think that uh, I would do that without really trying to think about what the repercussions would be. Is there a case in Canada that we should be focusing on? Because it amazes me how many Canadians don't know Shag Harbor. They, mm -hmm. they don't know Falcon Lake. But both of those incidents happened in 1967. And, you know, that's 55 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, are, are we getting any closer or are there any cases out there that you know of that we should be paying attention to? You know, I, I haven't heard of a big case like that in, in years. And the fact that those cases are so old, I mean, maybe it's the, maybe it's because it was a legitimate phenomenon at that time. And, the, and these things don't happen on a weekly basis or, or every few years. You know, they're not falling out of the skies. They're not landing everywhere. Um, maybe maybe the fact that it, it is so rare speaks to the legitimacy of the phenomenon. You know, maybe, maybe that's what it is that this, this, this happens so, so, um, so rarely that we have this kind of contact that it's not going to happen again for another 50 years or, or 500 years, you know, like it's look at um, the, uh, the blast at Tunguska, you know, I mean, that's something that doesn't happen all the time, but it's just, it's had this lasting effect. Um, whether it was, you know, <laughs> people want to say it was like an alien space drive exploded or more likely, I think they say it was a comet exploded in midair um, above the ground. Um, but whatever it was, it was a powerful event that does not happen every day. So there's a part of me that says, yeah, like, why we, why haven't we had a big case in so long? But then there's another part of me that says, well, these things are special. You know, it's it's not supposed to be part of just the weekly UFO roundup of, of sightings. Um those are major cases, major cases that had a lot of evidence behind them. So um, I'm actually not surprised we don't have them more often. I, I, would, I wish they'd be more often than, yeah, 50 or 60 years. But uh, mm. for, for me, it actually speaks more to the legitimacy of the, of the, of the especially those, those specific cases, even though I wish, I do wish that they happen more often. Jim has a question for you here. And he is asking, he says, hello, Ian. Where is the UFO crop circle hotspot in Canada, if you know? Mm. Well, it's not Ontario. There's not a lot of crops here. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Uh, you would have to go out to the prairie provinces. I remember when when the uh, when crop circles were were big. This would have been, I guess, late '80s, early '90s. Where I think was the primo time for crop circles. Um, prairie provinces, man. You know, Saskatchewan. Um, I don't recall any major case that stands out. I just know that we got them like almost everywhere else in the world got them, you know, and it was 
it was predominantly where you find lots of crops and that is the prairie provinces. So it was um, predominantly Saskatchewan, I believe. I think Manitoba had some and Alberta had some, but mostly Saskatchewan. Yeah. I blame the Ryder fans after a mm-hmm. Saturday game. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, because, the circles, you know? I mean, these are Ryder fans are people who wear watermelons on their head and no t-shirts painting their body green in mm-hmm. the middle of winter. Mm-hmm. You know, 30 below zero, and they're out in the football stadium wearing nothing but green paint and watermelon on their head. Weird people there. And it, and Jim's from Saskatchewan, so Jim, do us a favor. Just stand up and, and wave to everybody, because we're all going to be able to see you in your flatland area there. We really will. <laughs> Damn Riders fans. can't. Uh, they're weird. Weird. Hey, you know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm a former sports journalist, man. I've seen it all. I've seen it all. It's terrible. <laughs> terrible. Anyways, you know, getting back to UFOs in Canada here for a quick second, do you think we have had that incident, or is it Shag Harbor, you know, that Roswell-type incident? Because, you know, I was thinking, yes, it's been 50 years, but you know mm-hmm. what? Nobody's ever taken a submarine down there to mm-hmm. check to check it out. Yeah, I don't know. Um I don't know what the availability of submersibles are like these days. I mean, obviously, they're probably more available commercially or to rent them than they would be, say, even much less even when they didn't even exist in the 60s. Would there be anything down there to look look at? I mean, it was fairly close off the shore, I believe, where, where it was supposed to have come down. It wasn't like it was in the deep, deep ocean. So I think it would be possible. I mean, you've got all kinds of people that have done sonar tracks of the entire Loch Ness looking for the monster there. So you're telling me that you couldn't find someone with a grant to get some submersibles down there and just check it out. Uh, I don't know. I, I've never heard of it being done. I feel like it's something that one of these, uh, the UFO shows um, should do, you know, spend some money, you know, you got a legitimate case. It's right there. Um, you could even do a mix over with the, uh, the, the maritime culture, which is awesome. You know, that's my, my whole family is from out there and, um, I know that they would have a blast, you know, just, just having the crew out there. I remember when all the Oak Island stuff was going on. Um, hell, I mean, uh, the old, uh, I don't know if you remember uh, the horror movies back in the 80s. There was a movie, uh, My Bloody Valentine. They filmed it in Cape Britain. They filmed it in uh, Sydney Mines. And um, it's just the community rallies around these things, whether it's a UFO documentary or a horror movie being made in their town. You know, they it's a show, you know, make it a reality show. So, you know, generate some income, get some submersibles down there so we can see if anything ever crashed in Shag Harbor. You know, that's my pitch for the show. Do it. Well, you, you know, it's funny because a couple of years ago, uh, there was a, a commercial submarine crew out of Vancouver that mm-hmm. did a, a study of the Blue Hole of Belize. Mm-hmm. It had never been studied before. And uh, and topographically mapped, and mm-hmm. they were able to do that. And the the funny part about it is, all of a sudden lately, I've been thinking, I got to give these guys a call. Mm-hmm. I got to see if if they would be interested in doing another one because that was on Discovery Channel. They had Richard Branson, and mm-hmm. it would be cool to to see if these guys would want to take their submarine over to Nova Scotia to mm-hmm. see if there's any debris left from that ufo i mean mm-hmm. because when the military goes in they're just doing a quick sweep to get all the big stuff out of there they're mm-hmm. not digging three four feet under underground or or under rocks or or whatever that may be sticking out they're mm-hmm. not doing that oh and it's the ocean you know i mean the ocean by its very nature is mysterious you know like i've always been terrified of the ocean ever since a kid and you know i blame part of that on jaws oh that. yes oh yes yeah. But, uh, but but just by its very nature, I mean, the ocean is spooky. I remember watching, it was the very first movie I had seen where they really did Aliens with the Water. And that was James Cameron's The Abyss. Great movie. Which basically, it's fantastic. It's Close Encounters Underwater. But for me, it just made sense. And that was like, James Cameron is a filmmaker, but he's an engineer first. That's his background. So a lot of the stuff that he does has very practical applications. You know, he thinks of things in a very practical way, which is why his movies are are, are are usually pretty good. And the abyss works because it's believable. If you had aliens here, where would you, where would they go? So they wouldn't be bothered by the humans. Well, you go where the humans can't go, which is an ocean trench seven miles deep where the pressure would just crush anything. So that makes sense to me. You know, like it was, 
aliens are here. They don't want us to know they're there. Where would they go? It wouldn't be anywhere on land. You know, it would be it would be the ocean. So you, you hear about all kinds of spooky stuff out there in the ocean. I've heard that there, there's videos going around for a while that there's some weird kind of a structure that looks a lot like a pyramid at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. It's just whenever I see that stuff, it always creeps me out. You know, it's just I think, it all, like I said, it all goes back to Jaws for me. Just, I'm not going in that water. There could be anything in there. <laughs> yeah, I'm a meal, Ian. I'm a meal. <laughs> As I was saying earlier, I I was being interviewed by Mark Patron on Saga 960 earlier, and I got to tell you, he he was asking me about, you know, the oceans, and I'm like, dude, I don't go past my ankles. No 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 way. No way. It wasn't even just Jaws that scared me. It was Jaws gives that statistic, which is Mm -hmm. that 90% of all shark attacks occur in five feet or three feet of water, five feet from the shore. And I was like, I'm not going in the ocean ever again. (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm even if it's meal. not true, I mean it's in a movie, right? So you believe it? I, can, I can respect that. I can totally respect that. As yeah. PBR says in the chat room, don't get Dave started on Jaws. Honestly, <laughs> that I look. I like sharks. I don't like what we're doing to the shark population. No, I, I really know. don't. I'm a big, big fan of sharks, but mm-hmm. I'm not a big fan of putting myself in danger to be no. food for sharks. No, I mean, I'm a horror writer. I mean, I write things that scare me. I, I, f- I feel like the reason why, if I am good at it, I think it's because I'm very true with my my uh, with my with fears. You know, if I'm scared of something and I can write about it, then maybe other people will be scared. And you could say that maybe it's a form of, uh, of catharsis and, I, and I'm purging myself of this fear. No, absolutely not. I'm just, misery likes company, man. And so does fear, <laughs> you know? So I spread it around. Um, it's It's primal. Uh, I'm the same way. I'm terrified of the ocean. I'm terrified of sharks, but I love sharks. I love Shark Week. Agreed. I watch it every year. Um, um, I don't believe that sharks should be hunted or killed. When I when whenever you see, that's why I like Shark Week. Whenever they've got the the episodes about people um, people who have survived shark attacks, they're never angry about the shark. They're not like, oh, I want that shark dead. I want that shark hanging on my wall. You know, it's no, no, no. I was in his environment, and this is what happens when you're in their their environment. Like. Hunt, you, you can't get revenge on an animal. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it really is true. Um, I, uh, I think um, even Peter Benchley, who, who wrote Jaws, um, it was a huge success for him. The movie was an even bigger success. People forget in his later life, he, he, didn't, um, he didn't sort of re- regret really writing Jaws, um, but he regrets the fact that it kind of demonized sharks. And he worked with all kinds of groups, National Geographic and everything, for the preservation of sharks and to stop those kinds of, you know, hunts and culls. Um, because he did feel a bit responsible for them, you know, and how could you not? So it was something that I really respected him for doing because they are scary, but it doesn't mean that we should be, you know, hunting them to extinction. You know, I agree. We're going to get to more audience questions when we come back from the break, because we only have two and a half minutes left, but you mentioned the movie, the abyss, yes. you know, there's a couple of movies outside of close encounters, which I still think is the greatest UFO movie of all time. But I think the two most underrated, one is The Abyss, Mm -hmm. and number two, it's a Disney movie from the 1980s called Flight of the Navigator. Oh, yeah. I saw it in theater. That's a great movie. And you know what? I loved that movie as a kid, Mm -hmm. but knowing what I know now about UFOs and people uh, claiming they've flown the craft and it was... It's all about consciousness, and that's mm-hmm. really a lot of studies that heroes and mentors of mine like Grant Cameron have mm-hmm. been talking about over the last few years. That movie was way ahead of the time, Flight of the oh, Navigator, okay. and I highly recommend if people haven't seen it or haven't seen it since they were, they were a child to watch mm-hmm. that movie again. It is way ahead of the time, mm-hmm. way ahead. It um it it's it dealt with not just missing time before missing time was even a real thing, but the worst kind of missing time when when he comes back and he realizes he doesn't find that he's been gone for not just hours but for years. This is a Disney movie. Like I remember watching this in the theater. Like that scared me as a kid. Like he comes home and his his parents are a little bit older. His his old his brother is now older than him. He doesn't recognize him. So like that, that really bothered me. Like I saw that movie when I was like eight or nine. And, and to me, that was the scary part was what if you, what if you go out one night and you sort of trip and fall and you, you, you feel like you just, you know, you're kind of dazed, but you're only out for a minute, but you're actually out for, I can't remember what it is. Like it's like eight or 10 years. He's been gone. And you come back and like your, your parents are 10 years old, older and your younger brother is now your older brother. It's, it, it was really disturbing for me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I absolutely 
I absolutely agree. And I think if anybody wants to get into studying UFOs or extraterrestrial contact, those are the movies, along with E.T. Those would be the four movies that I would recommend to anyone. I think the other ones are just not worth the time. I really do. I, I may be old school on that, but that's just the way I think. And, uh, you know, we're going to get into more audience questions when we come back from the break, Ian, because I know there's a few that have lined up here that I got to get to in our chat room on YouTube and uh, Twitch. And I promise them I will get to them. Uh, but Ian, so far, this has been a great show for us and uh, given a lot of CanCon. When we come back from the break, we're, uh, we're going to take your questions, and then we're going to shift into hauntings, ghosts. Another major fascination of our guest tonight, Ian Rogers, his website, ian-rogers.com, where you can find all of his books. He's got a great series, including one that's being turned into a Netflix movie. We're going to find out what that is and more when we return with Ian right after this on Spaced Out Radio. Had to bring up Jaws, didn't you? Scare the daylights out of me. You know what I actually did a few months ago is I actually went and bought myself a Jaws t-shirt. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I remember uh, back in 2010, I took my daughter to Universal Studios. Mm -hmm. And we we were taking the tour. And she's like, uh, I'm like, honey, I said, you got to take the the outside seat here. And she's like... (laughs) She's like, why? I said, because when we get to the Jaws side, literally the shark is going to jump out at us and I'm going to freak out and start screaming and crying. And she's like, really, Dad? And sure enough, that's what happened. You got to get this. This is a book, uh, Jaws Memories from Martha's Vineyard. Oh, my goodness. But it's a... uh... It's all these photos, like hundreds of behind-the-scenes photos from the shoot. So it's got everything in it. You're not going to find a better book. Oh, I mean, my. If you're trivia, it's got everything. Oh, just, that just massive. freaks so me cool. out. You know, a, a few years ago, I was invited and spoke at a conference in uh, in Provincetown, Massachusetts, which is where Martha's uh, Vineyard is. It's, right. it's right on the end of that tip of, mm-hmm. of Massachusetts. And here I am with... Uh, couple of my buddies that that are there and literally we're walking by the water and I've never seen this before but there are literally signs right there like because you got the rock wall and then it just drops into the ocean like maybe 10 12 feet and there's signs warning people do not swim here due to great white sharks right and I'm like I'm dead I am mm-hmm. so dead right now I'm even scared just to see that sign because I like, freak you know that they're there. That. Like, you feel like you feel like if you just pick, you just put your foot in, I'm going to be that statistic, right? Yep. Because like, oh, you're more you're more likely to be hit by lightning. Yeah, I'll take the lightning hit. You know, I'll yeah. take the hit because I don't want to be not on. You know, it's just that's going to traumatize me. Oh it's, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, know, I was, it's like um, I want to go to Hawaii one day. You know, I want to go out there. I want to learn to surf. And it's now I'm thinking, no. Like, um, no. I can't go in the ocean. I'll be terrified. I'll be that guy. Like they say, oh, statistically, it's not going to happen. It's like, no, no, it'll be, it'll be me. It'll just, it's going to sense my fear. It's going to be like, uh, you know, I'm sure like, like a dog, they say dogs can smell fear, like sharks, <clears throat> it'd be like barbecue sauce. I'd be soaked in that fear. Mm-hmm. It's right at me, man. Mm-hmm. That's why I've never watched Sharknado. And you know, my, my biggest fear with contacting these guys with the scuba team, with the mm-hmm. dive team is like I, I follow the whole shark thing, like great whites on the East coast and everything. Cause they fascinate me. I love great white sharks. Mm-hmm. I, I really do. Uh, but the thing that really freaks me out about it is because of the warming ocean coming North. Now, all mm-hmm. of those great white sharks on the East coast have moved into that, that mm-hmm. shag Harbor area in Nova Scotia. And even here on the West coast, they're starting to see more and more great white sharks around Victoria and mm-hmm. the west end of Vancouver Island. It's mm-hmm. only a matter of time between before those big fuckers decide to come on the inside of the Georgia Strait and the Juan de Fuca, and they're getting people in in White Rock and in, in Vancouver. I'm hey, man, not putting myself in that in that territory. No, no, I like my life, man. I got yeah. a lot of books, right? I'm not going into the water, so yeah, no. 
no friggin' way. No way. If you, uh, if you if you can handle it, I mean, Jaws, Jaws is the classic, and most shark movies are not really that good. But um, I watch them all. I give them all a chance. Yeah. But no. one I saw that was actually quite decent, it's an Australian movie called The Reef. And it's just, it's, uh, it's this guy, his brother, um, brother's girlfriend, and his, and the, the main character's ex-girlfriend. They're on this sailboat. The boat hits a reef, tips, and they now have to swim to an island about five miles away while a shark is stalking them. And it is nope. terrifying. Nope. <laughs> nope. It's hard to watch. I don't, you, I don't you, you are literally I giving me anxiety know. just thinking yeah. about it, dude. I know. I know. Even, even me telling it, I was like, I was like why am nope. I doing this? No, 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 no. You know, it, it's like it's like when the movie Meg came out about yeah. the Megalodon, because I still think Megalodon exists somewhere. Because yeah. the image that I get of that is, like, I think about 10, 15 years ago, there was this great white, 15, 16-foot great white shark that was caught up dead in the, in the nets that kind of protect the beaches in Australia. And... Literally, there was this shark bite from spine wrapped around to spine. And scientists said that was one bite. And they believe that it was somewhere between a 30 to 40 foot great white shark that caused that bite. If there's a 30 to 40 foot great white shark out there, there's a bloody megalodon out there somewhere. There really is. Give me about, we got about 15 seconds here. Hi, Cedric. How you doing, man? Thank you to Dan, to Kat, and to Fapster for the amazing Super Chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. And hit that thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you have missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button, our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Author extraordinaire from Peterborough, Ontario, we have Ian Rogers with us. His website, ian-rogers.com, where you can check out all of his books. You can find them online or in major bookstores as well. Loves to write about horror, the creepy things in life from ghosts all the way to your worst imagination like getting eaten by sharks. No, he hasn't done that yet, but... You'll have to watch the YouTube side of things to see what we were talking about during the break. And both Ian and I are now freaked out because we were talking about Great Whites the entire time and eating us whole. Yes, that is a nightmare. Ian, welcome back. Well, thank you. And uh, I won't tell you that um, the story that I just finished writing just a couple months ago is called uh, Deep Blue Grass. And it's about a guy who wakes up and finds a shark swimming in his back lawn. So... I'm sorry. <laughs> Another one. Yeah, that they- nothing to do with anxiety there. <laughs> nothing to do with anxiety there. But all right, let's get to a question from Vinny here, who is asking, Ian, what's your favorite horror movie ever? Favorite horror movie ever. Oh, well, we already talked about Jaws. Uh, it's hard to pick one. I mean, the classics are classics for a reason. I try and pick some ones maybe people won't have heard of. I still say Gold, Poltergeist holds up. Um, Poltergeist, um, I like Poltergeist because no one actually dies in it. Um, it's terrifying, and you think, oh, no, it must have a huge body count because that seems to be the way that we judge the quality of any horror movie in this day and age. But Poltergeist is still very much a family horror movie. Um, and still terrifying. I just watched it within the last year or so, and it still absolutely holds up. I'm also a big fan of um, the Blair <clears throat> the Blair Witch Project, which I know is really divisive with some people, but I loved it. Um, it felt like a, it felt like a real real footage of what 
some kids went through. It just, it felt that that was why it was scary to me. Um, I liked that it didn't resort to CGI or some big rubber, rubber monster in the end. Um, it's, it has a conclusion where it's, it's not total closure, but it's enough that, you know, that nothing good happened to these kids. And for me, it just, it really did for the woods, what Jaws did for the ocean. You know, like I love the woods. I love hiking. Um, I think camping is great. But like these guys are going into like pure uncut woods, like there's no forest ranger that's going to be able to find them. And for me, that's terrifying. You know, it's just for me, there's no place scarier to be at night, you know, than the woods, you know, um, except maybe maybe the ocean. Um, but we won't go there again. So, wow. yeah, I would say Poltergeist, uh, Blair Witch. Um, I'm also a really big fan of there's an Australian movie um, called uh, Picnic at Hanging Rock. And it's, uh, it takes place in um, the year 1900, and it's a girls' school goes off to um, uh, Hanging Rock, which is a uh, uh, this giant kind of like a rock structure in, in Australia um, for a picnic. And while they're there, uh, four girls mysteriously disappear, and they're never found. And the movie sort of revolves around... Um, the investigation and finding these girls and how it affects the the community because there's just no answers and it's just sort of how the community how the school how the family members sort of just break down and uh, so it's i wouldn't say it's an out and out um horror movie it's probably more of a supernatural movie or a ghost story but it's to me it's got this dreamy nightmare quality to it that i find absolutely terrifying and it's one a lot of people don't know most people know jaws most people know blair witch but uh um, picnic at Hanging Rock. I think uh, if you could track that one down, or or Lake Mungo. Lake Mungo is one of my new favorites. It's sort of a mockumentary um, ghost story about um, a family. Uh, their daughter has drowned, and um, it's like a, the peeling of the onion uh, uh, as they start to experience supernatural uh, paranormal activity around their house. They're finding out more and more about this haunting, more and more about their daughter that they didn't know. Um, it's just it's it's sort of like a uh, this beautiful puzzle um, that's the that's being sort of solved one piece at a time to a conclusion, which is just it's one it's just got one of these final final one of these final shots, which is just absolutely terrifying. So, and again, it's a movie that a lot of people don't really seem to know about. So, mm-hmm. uh, Lake Mungo. See, I love Blair Witch Project because of the just the everything about it, you know, and I think I was like the entire audience just wishing that young lady would just shut the hell up, yep. you know, mm-hmm. stop being a know-it-all work as a team mm-hmm. and shut the hell up. Well, it was, I remember a lot of it was apparently sort of very gorilla style, very ad libbed, but they had things they had to do. Like uh, on this day, you're going to pick a fight with so-and-so about this, but they would let the actors come up with the dialogue to do that. So some things were, were very organic and some things were sort of, constructed as in in the whatever script that they had but um i think that yeah a lot of people don't like heather's character because yeah she's very pompous and she's very arrogant and there's a fairly good argument to say the reason why they get lost in the first place is 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 her is is because of her so you're not supposed to like her um and i think a lot of people just sort of like oh i really hate this person i really hate this character it's like well you hate the character you don't hate the actress she just did a really good job of playing someone that you are supposed to hate right and she, and she does sort of come full circle in the end when she does her uh her one shot confessional there um of course it's a little too uh, a little too little too late at that point but um it's that iconic oh, yeah. we know about right so from yeah that movie. i also like paranormal activity mm-hmm. the original one yeah you yeah, know, no. because that came out right when my, when I started having my own experiences and my house started becoming really haunted mm-hmm. and that's, that one was freaking me out. I was just waiting for cloven hoofs to show up on my wood floors. Oh yeah. I saw that in the theater with, uh, with my wife and, um, we, we were both absolutely terrified and it was just, uh, I can remember the last time where I was just so scared by a horror movie and we were coming back to the parking lot to the car and she stops her for a second. She goes, um, if you, I'm just going to tell you right now, Ian, if you ever do that to me as a joke, if you just stand next to me, next to the bed in the middle of the night, I'll divorce you immediately. Like, she's like, there'd be no argument. I will just divorce you. If you do that as a joke, she was just, <laughs> she was having none of that. I was like, that's fair. It's like, don't do it to me either. And we'll get along fine. <laughs> All right. John is asking Dave and Ian, what is your favorite Disney movie ever? Disney movie. Hmm. You know, um, I'd probably go Alice in Wonderland. 
You know, I thought um, I'm always a fan of the book and the book is messed up, especially when you see the way they sort of Disney fied that movie. But again, but even as a Disney movie, it's also kind of messed up. There was, there was stuff in that movie that I actually thought was really scary. Um, I look back on it. That was one of these movies that my sister and I used to just rent endlessly when we were kids, like star Wars, we just, you would just be able to recite those movies. Um, uh, and for me, it was just, I don't know if it was just the, uh, the animals or, or the creepy flowers, everything was alive or, or the way that Alice just could never get home and no one wanted to help her. That just really bothered me. You know I mean? I think when you're a kid, the idea of being lost, you know, being away from your parents is like one of the, the your great fears. So I think um, that's, of course, the whole plot of Alice in Wonderland is that she can't get home. And not only will no one help her, but they're all smiling. You know, they're all having they're all having a laugh at her expense. They're all sort of really enjoying themselves that that she's in this sort of <laughs> this peril, this turmoil. Um, so I think for me, even though it was a Disney movie, I, I think I liked it because it was like, wow, like it's actually kind of subversive. This is like Disney doing a horror movie for kids. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say mine if I were to look back on it, I'm a big fan of the Pixar movies. Mine would be the Toy Story movies. And I'm not going to lie, in Toy Story 3, where Andy handed the the toys off to another kid, I hated that. I cried. I yeah. cried at that. I'm like, come on, Andy. They're your toys, man. You just can't do that to your favorite toys because I still have my own toys, man. Like my big Tonka trucks, I still have them. So I was pissed off at Andy for that. I know it's only a cartoon, but Andy, what are you doing? You're going to regret that. Hey, what about the first uh, or the first 10 minutes of Up? You know, who didn't cry? If you didn't cry at that, you're a yep. robot. You yep. know, I will say that, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the Michael Leger, the Michael Leger is asking, Ian, did you ever see the Changeling 80s movie? Oh, yeah, I love Changeling. I literally just got the limited edition fancy Blu-ray, which comes with a copy of the soundtrack, like, last week. So I was on, um, I can't remember where I found I was on Amazon buying something. And um, I think I just threw it on my wish list. And I was like, oh, yeah, I want to watch The Changeling. And then I was remembering, oh, yeah, there's this new fancy DVD out. And, again, it's another one of these uh, horror movies. And uh, I'm pretty sure it's Canadian, if or at least was shot in Canada. I think it was shot on the West Coast. Um, I might be wrong. But George C. Scott... Um, and just got some of these iconic scenes. I mean, like, I don't think there's a drop of blood in this movie and it's still absolutely terrifying. It's just, it's your classic, almost like a Gothic ghost story. Um, all I'll say is the scene with the rubber ball. And if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, you got to watch it. But I mean, it's a, uh, it's a classic. I mean, it, for me, it's up there with, uh, with Poltergeist and the exorcist and all those movies of the seventies and the eighties, the big, uh, the big horror boom, you know? You know what one actually really got me? And it's not really a horror movie. It's it's more of a, you know, an extreme type film is, uh, oh gosh, now I can't remember. The Purge. Oh yeah. Yep. The Purge. I mean, could you imagine how, if that happened? Like, I, I know people, I mean, we all have a hit list. Mm -hmm. We all do. And if you mm -hmm. don't, you're lying. Right? Or show girls, man. That was a scary movie too. You know, like imagine that happening. Which, so, which movie? Showgirls. <laughs> terrifying yeah but with the purge i mean the fact that you know everybody's having to lock down their houses and you got 12 hours and you don't know if you're going to survive or not mm -hmm. i mean that is just whacked just well, whacked people, uh, people they they relate to that so much or at least maybe they could even see it happening in the near future enough that they've done like i mean how many of those movies are there now there's three or four of them and there's i think there's going to be a tv series prequel there is, or there, there is a tv series to it the prequel and that's yeah. on uh, amazon it was fantastic mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic uh jim is asking here have ian have you ever seen demon seed and your thoughts yeah demon seed um that's another 70 i think that was uh, julie christie um if I remember correctly, I'm the big movie guy, so I'm being. I have to use all my movie chops right now. Um, yeah, and I think Dean Koontz wrote the novel. It's uh, it's sort of like this woman and sort of this high tech house of the future, and what happens when the AI computer of that house falls in love with you and makes you its prisoner. Um, I think it was definitely ahead of its time. Um, I don't know if the movie has um, aged well. Um, I haven't seen it in at least 20 years. Uh, I feel like it's one of these things where at least the technology is like, you all, you watch a lot of these old Michael Crichton ones, anything pre, uh, 
pre-Jurassic Park, you watch like Andromeda Strain or uh, or Westworld, and they're still good movies. But I mean, a lot of the tech or a lot of the the parts that are aged just sort of it's almost kitschy now. You know, it's uh, it's still watchable because the the story is the boss and the story still holds up. So I remember I remember I remember Demon Seed being uh, terrifying in that sense. And again, I won't blow the ending, but it's got one of these really <laughs> really messed up endings where. Um, when you realize it was made in, in like I said, it's late seventies or early eighties, you're almost surprised that they were maybe not surprised they were able to get away with it. Maybe they would do something even more twisted today if they rebooted it. But I remember thinking it was pretty messed up for, for its time. You know, it was one of these movies that's got one of those final images that sticks with you. You know, Kurt Seltzer with a splash of lime is asking, which is better, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre or the new one? Oh, you know what? Which new one? The one with Matthew McConaughey or the one that they made in the, the 2000s? You know, I I don't even know if I've seen either of the new ones. I saw the original. I saw part two when it started to be a little silly, which I still kind of liked. It's just a very different movie tonally than the first one. But, you know, I, for me, it's the first one. I mean, it's the original. You, you, can all, you can't usually go wrong with, with, with the original. Um it feels like you're watching a true crime documentary. You know, I mean, you've got that. It opens with that narration John, done by a very young John Laroquette. You know, there's a bit of movie trivia for you um, um, introducing the film. And it's just scary. Again, an, another movie that despite its title, despite its reputation, does not have a ton of blood in it. If you go back and rewatch it, you're thinking that, oh, there must be blood flying and limbs being hacked by this chainsaw. And that's not what happens. It's actually there's there's a lot more. Um, you are a lot more implied violence than stuff that's actually seen on the screen. Um, when I think of a movie where, you know, is the new one as good as the original? Um, I would say uh, the only one I can really, that really comes to mind would be like Dawn of the Dead, you know, like it was almost blasphemy to me to, to remake that movie in the first place because the original is such a horror classic and a zombie classic. The fact that you could one up Night of the Living Dead, which was a seminal horror movie, um, and still do something very different within the the zombie um, uh, subgenre. Dawn of the Dead is just uh, it's a classic, but but Zack Snyder's remake with with Sarah Pauly of all people, um, who I don't think has done horror before or since that movie, it's actually really really good. You know, it's 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 the same setting of a mall um, where these survivors are holed up, but it's also a very different movie in a lot of respects. So um, that's the only one that really comes to mind where I think that the original, um, uh, maybe not as good as the, or sorry, the, the reboot or the remake is not as good as the original, but at least it stands on its own. It's still, uh, in my opinion, a quality flick. You know? Oh, I hear you. What about alien movies for horror movies? What you know what? The one that terrified me a lot, I, was, I, was, I think it was due for a rewatch because someone was talking to me about it a few weeks ago when we were talking in uh, UFO Town was uh, Fire in the Sky. And uh, I hadn't seen that in a long time. I remember there was obviously a lot more character driven. And uh, as a kid, you don't really care about character driven. You're just thinking, oh, there's only 10 minutes of alien stuff and they save it for the end when he has his traumatic flashback sequence, uh, which they do. But again, it's, it's the movie was really supposed to be about uh, Travis Walton's friends being persecuted for his um, alleged murder when he's missing all this time. So it's, um, you know, D.B. Sweeney and... Uh, Robert Patrick, you know, great performances um, by the by the actors, and they really carry it. Um, and and the scenes with the aliens, I remember being quite quite traumatic. You know, I mean, imagine well, imagine Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the version of an alien abduction. You know, it's just like it's not this clinical thing with they putting you on this seal tray and they're they're taking delicate samples with scoops and stuff. It's like no, no, they're just putting you down on the slaughterhouse tray. Here's our, here's the, the surgical instruments. We don't really care. Anesthetic? No, we don't have that here. You know, it's just, it's, it's gruesome. Yes. I You're... wish they would have told the real story though. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, and, yeah. and I mean, I think Hollywood really pushed a, a real f number of buttons that really still play with the heads of people like Mike Rogers and Travis Walton. <laughs> I mean, recently they had a big brawl on social media about that. Yeah. And it, it really is too bad. But, you know, for me, Fire in the Sky, I, I can tell you, I was on a double date with my friend. And we mm -hmm. went and saw a Fire in the Sky. And we decided that we were going to take a ride through the mountains with these girls afterwards because we were all a little freaked out. It was one of those moonless nights. And we come around this corner. And what do we see on the side of the road? We see two red lights flashing. 
mm-hmm. and they're flashing and it's not the police. And the ladies were like, oh my God, what is that? What is that? And it happened to be one of my friends who put his car in the ditch while in reverse because I think a bear or something had, had ran across the road and it freaked him out. So they, they hit reverse on the vehicle and he went into a ditch, but it was the hazard lights on the car. But we were all freaked out over that. Absolutely freaked out. Well, I'll tell you, the the two flashing red lights just made me think of another movie and another great case that... Uh... The Mothman Prophecies. Um, it's, it's sort of a, uh, I feel like it's a totally underrated horror movie. Um, I find it's actually quite terrifying, really, really well done, very stylistic, a great soundtrack even. Um, and, the, the, and it only really covers a fraction of the case itself. And I think the Mothman case is, is, is like the Guardian case. The Guardian case, which I, even though I believe it's a hoax, whereas the Mothman, I feel like there was something a lot more tangible there. But Mothman was so interesting because by its very title, some people just sort of dismiss it because it sounds silly. You know, oh, Mothman, it's just a, a giant moth person. And that's how the case starts. But I mean, if you read the book by by John Keel, which is one of the best books, one of the best books about a, about a, a, a parapsychological investigation, uh, bar none, um, it starts as a as like almost like as like a cryptid. It starts as this this entity, this Mothman, but then it starts it involves um, UFOs, um, missing time, uh, premonitions, uh, Men in Black. You know, all this phenomenal poltergeist activity over a like 16, 18 month period that culminates mm-hmm. with the collapse of the Silver Bridge. But I mean, there had never been a case in in my memory which really it was it was just like for that period of time, reality was just dragged across a cheese grater, you know, and all this weird stuff just poured in is what Mm -hmm. it felt like. So yeah, we got this moth guy and there's also going to be some weird poltergeist activity in this one neighborhood. And this, this, these three people are going to start receiving phone calls from this person, Indrid cold. And they're also predictions, you know, it's just, it was so random and weird um, that I feel like something must've been happening there. Very true. Very true. You know what? Nicole brings up a good point here. The movie signs, Oh yeah! Uh, oh yeah! You know, you know that scene. What freaks me out the most now, looking back on it, remember when the young Mel Gibson's young son crawls on top of the car and he mm-hmm. sticks the baby monitor up, and you hear that. Mm-hmm. I've actually had that happen in my backyard. Oh really? <laughs> where it, there was like this conversation going on in my yard, and it. I'll tell you the legend of Carl one day. Okay. All right. Carl's an alien who showed up at my window one day while I was broadcasting this show. All right. And the energy was the same. And after the show, I went outside. It was real freaky. I watched these two, like, Nike swoosh, swooshes that were li- like in a yin and yang ball go right mm-hmm. in between my vehicles and then come back. And I was on the phone with a guy named Olive Phillips when that happened. And then I hung up from Olive called up my ET guy, our Keith Andrews, and out of the, and I'm hearing, I'm standing up on my patio, which is on my second floor, and, I, and I'm hearing this, you know, from my backyard to up my driveway and where my trees are, and I'm like, I'm freaking out. And the first question Keith asked me, he's never been to my house ever, doesn't even know where I live. He says, by the way, Dave, have you heard any strange sounds? Because he's mm. very intuitive. And I'm like, yes. And and I, I, I did the clicking sound. And he's like, did it sound more like this? And he did this thing with his throat. And I'm like, that's the sound, man. That's the mm-hmm. sound. And as soon as he did that, right in my backyard, there's going on, right? And I'm just like freaking the hell out. So mm-hmm. I did what any man would do. I, uh, you know, the UFOs, I it felt like I was being called to another area. Where, like mm-hmm. I have a lake, like two two, three miles from my house. And I felt like I was being called to the lake. So I did what any man would do. I drove to Tim Hortons first, the mm-hmm. opposite direction. I grabbed myself an ice cap and a yep. donut just in case I was going to be taken. You know, I got to have some refreshments. Mm-hmm. Then I went down to the lake, sat there for 45 minutes, waiting for the mothership to happen. And nothing. 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 Yeah. One... At least you had food though. Yes. I had my ice cap and I had my donut. I'm still pissed off Timmy's canceled the duchy, though. Anyways, mm. one final question. We got one minute here. Kirk Seltzer with a splash of lime wants to know if you've seen the Green Inferno or Come and See. Very disturbing movies, he says. 
I've seen Come and See. It's definitely very disturbing. Uh, Green Inferno, I haven't seen it. Uh, I'm kind of pick and choosy with Eli Roth's movies. I mean, I know what he's doing. I mean, he's sort of the, uh, the uh, what is the movie? Hostel. You know, he's sort of, that, those are kind of his movies. I mean, it's just not really my jam. You know, I'm not really into the whole torture porn thing. So, I mean, uh, I saw Cannibal Holocaust. So I feel like if you've seen that, you don't need to see The Green Inferno because that's sort of like his homage to that movie. So maybe I will someday, but uh, I'm in no rush to see it. Let me put it that way. Oh, that, that's uh, just the title and just what you described. That's totally way out of my realm. Way yeah. out of my realm. It doesn't really interest me that much. And I love horror. I love horror in all its shapes and forms. But uh, like I said, it's... Uh, it's not, it's not my go-to, you know? Well, we have you for another 30 minutes and this interview kind of went off the rails. We were supposed to be talking paranormal about your books, uh, especially the one that's going into Netflix. So the next half hour, Ian, we're going to literally get right into that because we got to jump in. We got to find out about your books, what you're writing on, what's turning into a Netflix movie that anybody can watch. I'm excited for you, man. And I hope you are too. Ian Rogers is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. His website, ian.rogers or ian-rogers.com. Pardon me, ian-rogers.com. We'll be back right after this. All right, man, we're clear. (laughs) I knew once we got into movies, we could just be chatting about that. Oh, yeah, it happened. (laughs) <laughs> put it this way it, it this show the one thing that i love about it is we keep it natural and if it mm-hmm. goes off the rails from the plan we're okay with that i'll be right back my friend okay i'm just going back through the i got thread. your microphone on so you could talk to the audience if you want okay yeah i'm just going back through the thread let's see what else people are saying here seven that's a good movie that's another david fincher movie that's a great movie contact yeah if that's what you're talking about the movie that's another that's a great movie i think i saw that movie like two or three times in the theater just really really decent very different from the book too but uh i like that though it's uh as someone who's uh having the film treatment done to one of his books i i I am all for making changes because the movie movies and books are very different medium phantasm phantasm's awesome phantasm is a classic um i'm actually writing a uh uh, sort of a supernatural detective series called the blacklands and um this toronto-based private investigator felix wren sort of investigates supernatural cases and one of them is a novella called uh the sun never rises and it's heavily influenced by phantasm just I really like that they took the um, uh, funeral home uh, motif and used it as a mythology in horror fiction or horror film, which I'd never seen before. You know, like uh, you've had graveyards, you've had coffins and stuff and vampire movies, but they really used it as this way of creating a uh, almost like a mythology, you know, like the tall man is creepy, you know, like the 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 mausoleum is uh, you, you can say mausoleums are always kind of spooky. But this one, it's, uh, you know, there's almost, there is, well, there is a science fiction component to, to that movie. It's not just horror. You know, there, there is something uh, science fiction based in it. It's just bonkers. It's just a bonkers movie that you, if you try to compare Phantasm to something else, you can't. You think, oh, it's like this or it's like that. You can't do that with Phantasm. It's, uh, it's so good. Even the sequel's pretty good. Uh, the second one's good. Uh, after that, it's kind of... Uh, diminishing uh, returns but um yeah ever had a dream that could easily be a movie <sighs> you know what? i'm not a big dreamer you know i wish uh, i think <laughs> i think most of my stuff comes out during the day so that when i sleep uh, my brain finally takes a break so uh i'm uh i dream but nothing memorable man that's all i could tell you <laughs> not, certainly nothing that would make a good movie um uh, trying to keep up with the thread here. See if there's anything else. The fourth kind was good. Yeah, fourth kind. Um, yeah, the owl imagery. There were there was a couple scenes in that which uh, I actually found quite uh, unsettling. Um, 
Mila Jovovich is not really uh, given any props for her acting abilities because they just sort of people just sort of know her from like the Resident Evil movies and stuff, which are good. You know, they're good. They're fun popcorn movies. But I actually thought she was uh, her acting was uh, it's quite decent in that movie. I thought she did great. And it's, it's just a spooky movie, too. It's uh, I can't remember how it ended, how it ended. But I remember it was quite uh, I care if it was open ended or if it was just quite disturbing or both. But, yeah, that's uh, that's a decent movie. Yeah, District 9. District 9 is a classic. Um, I wish uh, uh, Blomkamp would have been allowed to make his Alien movie, but uh, that's not going to happen. So uh, I heard he's doing District 10, though, so we'll get a sequel to that finally. Fifth Elements, great fun movie. Uh, it's one of my dad's favorite movies. I saw it a couple of times in the theater. Again, kind of bonkers. I mean, a lot of people don't like it. They think it's kind of silly, but uh, I like it. I think it's great. Um, I didn't like Valerian as much as more recent uh, science fiction one. I thought it was just a little uh, scattered. Uh, beautiful visuals. The opening sequence is fantastic with the space station, but uh, I'll take Fifth Element over Valerian any day. Dark City, awesome movie. Uh, great director. Dreamscape. Dreamscape is awesome. I haven't seen Dreamscape in years. That movie scared me. That movie really scared me as a kid. The imagery of the nuclear <laughs> war, the big snake man, the big viper-headed guy. That was... Uh, yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's um, it's a good it's a good movie. Solaris. Uh, actually, you know what? Both versions of it the uh, the Russian version and the uh, uh, Soderbergh version are both uh, are both decent uh, and a good book. You know, it's one of these movies where it's just uh, the book and the movie are quite different, um, but they're both decent. You know what movie was ruined by Hollywood was uh, the Devil's Pass, the story about the Dyatlov Pass. Oh yeah, yeah. They just turned that into a. Uh, uh, just like your typical kind of a silly uh, teen slasher found footage. I movie. know. Because I thought the book is awesome. The uh, there's well one of the there's a I can't remember which one it is. It's uh, it's the one where he really examines like the, all these different theories of what it could be, and it's just fantastic. I mean, it really dismisses all the stuff that wasn't really true, but like rumors and stuff that had been passed down as uh, as facts of the case. And it was like, well, they said that there was radioactivity found on one of the bodies. And it's like so. He gets to the root of where did that come from and where what's the origin of that story it was just it was a really good book that just really said like yeah this stuff was actually true and this stuff wasn't true and this was just um um you know uh, theorized at the time but people thought it was a fact it's a it's a it's another it's another really freaky case um and i wish i could remember the name of the book i think it's just uh mystery of diet love pass yeah but. Uh, we are uh, returning here in about 20 seconds. I want to say a big thank you to Dan, to Cat Chaser, to Fabster for the amazing super chats tonight. Thank you for the love and support. Thank you to all the veterans who are listening to this show right now. We absolutely love you. And, of course, to uh, all of our new subscribers who have clicked on in, listening for the first time in our chat room. Here we go. you like to connect with us head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info now back to dave scott and sor third and final hour of spaced out radio is now underway my name is dave scott thank you so much for taking the time to tune us on in we really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call earth Thank you to everyone tuning on in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Decarnate. Decarnate is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bubblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce author Ian Rogers. His website, ian-rogers.com. You can find all of his books there. And he's got a great series out called Every House is Haunted. And Ian, I want to learn about this series because actually one of them is developing into a Netflix movie. 
Yep, this is the book right here. Uh, whoops. <laughs> Every House is Haunted. And uh, yeah, it's a short story collection. It's my uh, first book. And uh, one of the stories from the book, um, The House on Ashley Avenue, as you said, it's uh, it's um, being developed for Netflix by, uh, produced by Sam Raimi. And it's going to be directed by uh, Corin Hardy, who is a uh, British filmmaker who has done a couple of horror movies, uh, The Hollow and uh, The Nun, which is one of the... Um, movies in the conjuring uh series of horror films so it's a it's a good group it's a, a fantastic group of people to be uh to be working with on this film so take us through it what's it all about uh basically it's it's my own twist on the haunted house story um it's sort of like you know one part men in black one part the x-files so it's about an insurance company called uh, the Mirville group and for all intents and purposes they're like any other major international insurance company, except they have a division that secretly investigates the supernatural. And part of this um, investigation is they have acquired over time eight pieces of property um, that are so paranormally polluted, so haunted, that they leave them purposely empty. They can't be inhabited by humans. They're too dangerous. So one of them um, is this house on Ashley Avenue. It's one of the, what they call the eight, collectively the eight. So I wanted to do my own take on the haunted house story, uh, my own kind of version of the X-Files, like without doing, without doing it uh, in your typical way with government. You know, this is not government. This is, um, this is an insurance company. So you've got insurance investigators, um, adjusters, people that are involved in, property and real estate, how would they handle a haunting, you know, versus um, your typical government, you know, cover up conspiracy. Uh, the, the the second story in the, in, in the series is called Go Fish, and it takes place at a haunted uh, fish processing plant. So again, like they're not all necessarily houses, they're, they're buildings that the Miraville group has acquired because they're just too dangerous to leave on the market. They buy them and then they sit on them. You know, they, they keep them off the grid, they keep them empty and they sort of study them, you know, as much as they can, because each one of these things is kind of like a caged animal, you know, cause uh, in, in the, in, in the house on Ashley Avenue, um, one of the characters is a psychic named Sally. And she, the first thing she says when, when they come to the house on Ashley Avenue is, why don't you just take a wrecking ball to it? You know, why don't you just destroy this thing if they're so awful? And the her mentor, the the investigator who uh, who she works with, her partner, just sort of looks at her aghast because he's like the idea of destroying these things um, never crosses the Mirable Group's mind because to destroy would be to destroy the cage, and if you destroy the cage, you set the thing the beast free. So it's sort of uh, they're caretakers of this property. It's a very uneasy relationship that they have with these things where. Um, uh, they have to sort of um, protect the public from them. But at the same time, the Mirvo group isn't completely altruistic. They have their own motivations, you know, like they, um, Sally is sort of the audience's character, the reader's character um, throughout these um, stories. And even though she's working with the group, she starts to question their, their, their motives after a while, you know, like, like, why do they want these things? Why do you know, what are they going to do with these things with this power, you know, um, it gave me to really explore haunted houses in a way that um, I hadn't really seen done before. For you writing this story and then having one turned into a Netflix movie with Sam Raimi, I mean, that's got to be a big thrill for you, man. Yeah, it's, um, I remember it was, it, you know, it was, I can tell you it was March 26th. It was the day UFO town went live that night and I got a, uh, a private message from one of the screenwriters. Um, uh, these two great guys, Jason and Andrew, uh, one of them reached out to me and said, Hey, have you heard the news? And I was like, no, I haven't heard it. And that's when he told me that uh, Netflix just bought the movie and uh, they're committed to making it. And um, we just immediately started celebrating, you know, it was, uh, it was just sort of off the hook. And I, I, for me at that point, I wasn't even just thinking of, um, what this is going to do for my writing career or money or anything like this. For me, it was, it was the, the joy of knowing that like my name is going to be sharing you know, the credits with, with Sam Raimi, you know, like uh, one of my favorite filmmakers, you know, I, I remembered as a, as a kid watching the original evil dead 
and how much it terrified me. It was like it was like the it was like the Blair Witch Project. It just it felt like it was a real movie because when you're watching the Evil Dead, the original, um, you don't know these actors. It's it's an indie movie. It looks very gritty. It looks very dirty. It looks like this is just happening to these these poor suckers who have rented this cabin. So I remember. Um, having to turn it off because I was so scared and finishing it in the morning and the, by the bright, bright light of day. So uh, my sister and I were just so spooked by this movie. So when I called her to tell her about the Netflix news, um, 30 years later, the first thing she did was she started crying, you know, and she was like, you know, mom, mom would have been so happy with this. You know, my mom passed away before she saw any of this stuff happen. And she's the reason why I was writing horror in the first place. So it's um, it just really meant a lot to me uh, on a personal level that 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 Sam was you know that he optioned this book in the first place a couple of years ago, and that he was finally able to get uh, to get this movie made at Netflix. It's it's it sounds like such a cliche to say it's a dream come true, but but it, it literally is. Anyone that knows me, anyone that grew up with me, and when this news went out, I got so many emails from family members or friends or people that I went to like elementary school or high school with. It wasn't just congrats. It was just like, oh, my gosh, you must be so excited, Sam Raimi. Like they knew how much this this meant to me. Um, That's the part that that really, really sticks with me. That's the part that um, that I'll always have. You know, it's uh, it's not something like, oh, hey, uh, it's going to be cool. I'll be on my there'll be a credit that says on and when this movie opens up, you know, based on the book by Ian Rogers, you know, produced by Sam Raimi. My name is going to be on a Sam Raimi movie forever. That that's pretty damn cool. Um, Damn right it is level man it's the personal level like this it's really really means something to me well congratulations for that because not a lot of authors out there and there's hundreds of thousands of authors not a lot of them get their books turned into a movie and Mm. you got to be commended for that you really you really really do And, and congratulations for having you know part of your dream come true on that I, I, I will say that. But when you come to this series, you know, what what made you write it? Was there anything that was specific in your town or true stories that you heard that made you decide to take this into fictionalized characterizations? You know, whenever I come up with an idea, it's usually something, it's usually two ideas. It's like, oh, I want to do a monster story or I want to do a haunted house story. But that's not really an idea. That's for me, that's sort of like something that's sort of like one dimensional. I need something else to hit that idea um, to spark it, you know, so it becomes a story. So I knew that I wanted to do something different with haunted houses, but I didn't want it to be a gimmick. I didn't want it to be something that was really cheap and was sort of like, oh, yeah, this is this. It's haunted houses, but but they're, you know, they're mobile homes, you know, Um I didn't want to read. It had to be, it had to be personal. And for it to be personal, it has to have good characters. So I was, when I was living in Toronto, I just go for walks. You know, I just walk around all the time. I'd walk in neighborhoods. And so I was walking through uh, Rosedale and um, there was a road that I was on. I think it was, it's not Ashley Avenue. It's, I think it's Ashley street or Ashton Avenue or something like that. I didn't use a real name in, in the story, but it's close. And there was just this house on the corner and it was next to this field where it looked like there was like a, there had been an old uh, baseball uh, diamond. And I was just looking at it and I was just thinking uh, at the house and I'm thinking, wow, I was like that, that field is really close to the house. If the kids were hitting balls, um, they could very easily break a window on this house. And the image that popped into my mind as I was thinking that was a baseball flying through a window and a piece of glass, um, going into the eye of a woman sitting at a makeup makeup table in front of that window. And it was just this really gruesome image, um, startling of, of this really terrible accident that caused this domino effect of, of, of what, what amounted to a haunted house. And for me, that was the image. I just sort of took it and ran with it. And I knew that this was going to be a series. And if it was going to be a series, it needs to stand on its characters. So it was really trying to come up with a couple of characters who weren't, your typical, you know, obvious Mulder Scully analogs or anything else that it was going to be compared to. Um, it was just trying to come up with two people who would just really, really complement each other, but would also challenge each other because, because it's not just going to be a one-off. It's going to be a series. These characters are going to grow and they're going to change. And um, for me, that's the most interesting part. Um, 
I think that's the reason why people don't have a lot of respect, even horror fans. I mean, we sort of have a laughing respect for, for slasher movies and Friday the 13th and stuff. But the reason why they don't have a lot of resonance is because you don't really care about the characters. You know, you're almost looking forward to Jason or Freddy hacking up these kids because they're so indispensable. Um, or they're, they're so dispensable. They're, 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 they, they've got no character. They've got nothing you really like about them. So for me, like a story, like plot is just basically things happening to people you've been made to care about. That's what plot is to me. So I knew you had to care about these characters. And if you're going to put them into these horrible situations, um, you don't want people cheering that they're going to die. You want them to get out of these houses, you know, the, these, these buildings, the eight. So I, for me, it always, it always succeeds or fails based on, based on the characters. Um, yeah, that's really more or less where it came from. For you, when you study hauntings, do you go into a lot of paranormal stories or do you just let your imagination run wild? It always comes from a place of reality to start with, but it's, it's like a diving board. You know, I think, you know, people, people want to take that plunge and the plunge is sort of the supernatural. It's the, it's the extraordinary parts of your stories. And if they don't take the plunge, you give them a little push (laughs) off that diving board, But, but the diving board is, is there. It's, it's it's what sets things in reality before you start twisting it with the supernatural. It's like um, it's something that Stephen King, I think, has done very well. And I think that's probably the secret to his success. Um, in addition to just being a very good writer, um, he takes something like a small New England town and then he twists it by having it being invaded by vampires. You know, so it's just like people can relate to those characters. People can relate to that town, which is why Salem's lot is such a good book. And then when the end, the vampires slowly start to infiltrate it, you become more, more afraid because you've been made to care about these people. And the town is so believable that you could almost start to believe the vampires, even though we don't believe vampires exist. We think that those are, are superstition or myths, right? So it's the suspension of disbelief. So he can, or me in that, in my case, sucker punch you with fear you know that's that's really what we're trying to do do you think horror in that entire genre has really gone to too much blood and guts and not about storyline anymore like jaws had an incredible storyline even Mm -hmm. an even as gory as a nightmare on elm street was it still had a Mm storyline that really freaked you out about going to bed at night just in case something happened Yet today, it's all about slashing and how much blood and and trying to figure out different grotesque ways on how we can murder somebody, Mm -hmm. you know, and and there isn't that that real high quality storyline anymore that's going to really give people a natural scare rather than a grossed out grotesque scare. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously, there's been sort of an advent of the like the so-called torture porn movies with your hostel and your saw and everything. And again, some of those movies, I mean, the original saw I thought was well done. It's grisly, but I thought that it was it was still a decent movie. Um, hostel, less so. I wasn't again. It's I don't care about those kids in that movie. So you, if you don't care about the kids, then you don't care what's being done to them. So it's. Uh, but again, I, I will sort of say it's not for me. So it's uh, it's hard for me to judge. I still think that there are quality horror movies um, being made. Um, I think uh, a movie like Insidious um, was was quite terrifying. Again, it's sort of it's a, it's its own play on both the haunted house and the possession um, horror tropes, and it does it very well. It was it was another movie a lot like um, Paranormal Activity that really scared me. I remember seeing that in the theater, and there was there was some good you know, I would say legitimate jump scares. I mean, jump scares are kind of easy and, and they're sort of frowned upon um, in equal measure because they tend to be overused or they tend to be kind of cheap shots. But the jump scares and in Insidious, I thought, were were, were earned and, and genuine. Um, and as we talked, like Paranormal Activity, another movie that's, that's not gory at all, um, very minimal budget, like uh, one sort of set, you know, taking place entirely in this couple's home and then still absolutely terrifying. You know, Blair Witch, I mean, obviously it's a bit older now, but still, um, I still think of it as kind of a modern classic. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely an audience and there's definitely more of a prevalence of, of the, the bloody carnage movies. But, um, I mean, if you're in there and you're still looking, there's still lots of quality, you know, horror movies being made that don't rely on blood and gore. But are they going to transfer over to the mainstream rather than just right into Netflix or Amazon? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a whole other discussion, right, in terms of distribution, especially now when you throw a pandemic into the into the into the mix. Uh, I can say with, uh, with the film that, uh, that uh, Corin and uh, Sam are making for Every House is Haunted, 
I was so glad that it went to Netflix and not to a, uh, a studio that was going to release it theatrically because now the pressure is gone of having that big opening weekend. Um, I mean, the pressure was, was always going to be there before, but now with the pandemic um, and you know, what, what do movie theaters look like in six months or a year, if they're even around, what does a movie opening look like? So it's, whereas if it's on Netflix, it could be on there for years, you know, it could find its audience right away. It could take its time to find its audience. So um, I really feel it's, it's the best home uh, for that movie. Um, I just couldn't be more excited about it. You know, when you talk about writing that you look for real instances and kind of build from there, what kind of stories are you talking to? Are you talking to paranormal investigators and saying, "Hey, what's the what's the scariest thing that uh, that you have going for you?" Or, or or what do you do? How do you come up with that? Yeah, I don't really talk to investigators. I mean, if anything, I mean, all you need to do is go online to a few parapsychology websites and see what the what the cases are. Or, or as I said, I mean, I just go out for I go out for walks. That's my exercise and you'd be surprised where, I mean, like I said, if you've got, if you've got an active imagination, like I do, um, uh, I was going through, um, my, uh, my, um, my in-laws, um, subdivision, uh, which is newer, it's a newer subdivision. So there's all kinds of streets that lead off with houses that aren't fully built or that dead end. And there's all kinds of, uh, like dirt Hills and, and plots. And I just thought like, wow, what if you bought a house at the end here? where you don't even have any neighbors yet because they haven't even finished building houses on the street and something happened to you here and you couldn't get out of your house. What if you were kind of like marooned in this house and like, maybe you don't even have your phone hooked up yet. You know, you can't, you don't have any neighbors, you know, you're basically on a, on a dead end because they haven't even finished building the street. So that was how I wrote this, that story, the uh, deep blue grass about this guy who wakes up and finds a, uh, a shark fin cutting through his lawn. And he can't get out of his house. He's sort of, uh, you know, his house uh, is, is like an island. And it was just sort of me taking something that on the surface seems kind of absurd, like a, this, a shark swimming through your lawn. But I treated it very realistically, as realistically as you can, a story like that. But it, it, there's realism within, within the fantasy. So the fantasy is, yeah, there's a shark swimming through this guy's lawn. And that sounds absurd. But within the story itself, there are rules. And the shark obeys those rules. It's not flying through the air. It's just swimming through the lawn like it's water. You know, it's still a shark. It doesn't have superpowers. Um, so it's it's fantasy, but you have to have rules within that fantasy. And that's how um, that's how I write. I, I try and find something that's that's normal or or every day, and I try to think of what the nightmare version of that would look like if I threw in a shark or or a haunting or. What if some? What if it started raining black rain, you know, and and it, and it was burning or or it, it was moving, you know? It's just I think of something. It's just it's just it's just tweaking it, you know. You don't you don't want to you don't even to do anything too extreme. It's uh, it's something that I feel uh, a little goes a long way, you know. Uh, horror horror likes to be subtle, you know. Final question from our audience tonight comes from Nicole, who is asking Ian, are you an experiencer inspired by the phenomena? You know, I have never seen anything. I've never experienced ghosts. I've never seen a UFO. I've never seen anything that I thought might be a UFO. Um, I've seen strange lights, but nothing that I thought was acting in a way that I would say, I don't know what that is. I'm always watching the skies. Um, uh, I'm very observant of my environment. So I feel like I'm ready <laughs> to see something, whether it's whether it's Mothman or, or a UFO or, or something. Um, and as I said, my, my, my family's got this rich heritage with, um, uh, ghost stories, uh, on the East coast. But again, for all my visits out there to Nova Scotia, uh, Cape Breton Island, I've never seen a thing. I, I, I want to, you know, I, I wish I had, but no, I'm sorry. All right. And you know what? We've got two minutes left here and I want to say a big thank you for you coming on spaced out radio for the first time. I had a great time with you tonight Ian and I think our audience really enjoyed you too and I hope we did you some justice as well my friend Yo, know absolutely this is fantastic it's uh the time has flown by and uh I'd love to come back again sometime absolutely we'd love to have you probably around Halloween oh uh, for sure that's yeah, what I'd do. love to have you on is around yeah. Halloween absolutely you know I got a couple of short stories like short short ones I could read something and uh yeah story if you want or uh give you an update on the Raimi movie you know let's do it Let's yeah. do it. We'll let Corns, the booking guy, know about that. 
And uh, one other thing with 90 seconds to go, if you don't mind, could you let everybody know where they can find your books, where they can find uh, more information on you? Yeah, everything you could find online. Uh, I'm a former web developer, so I've got some pretty good websites. Uh, Ian-Rogers.com or Ian Rogers, all one word, uh, .ca. Uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. Uh, my name on Twitter is One More Shadow. I'm on um, in, uh, Instagram. My name is Super Noir Troll. Um, but if you just search my name, Ian Rogers, like I said, uh, my links are everywhere. Um, yeah, reach out, say hello, buy a book. Um, <laughs> the links are all there. It's appreciate, appreciate it. Yeah, it, man, it, this was fantastic. This was uh, better than I thought. You know, I thought we were gonna have. I knew we were gonna have a good time. But it went better than I thought. And the audience kind of took it in their own direction from our chat rooms on YouTube and on Twitter and everywhere else. And I love it when that happens, when I kind of lose control like that and just let the audience have some fun. It's it's a lot of fun sometimes. So, Ian, a big thank you for coming well, on you, the show. And uh, you're a great guy. And I encourage all of our audience members to support you and your books. And good luck with the Netflix film. It's been great. Thank you. And thanks for everyone for listening in. All right. I'll get you to hold on here and uh, we're going to go off to commercial break here at the bottom of the hour. Once again, Ian Rogers, Ian dash Rogers.com or Ian Rogers.ca. And of course you can find all his books on his websites and online and in bookstores coming up next. We have the SOR news wire. We have the thought of the day. Stay tuned. Lots of spaced out radio continuing right after this. Rock and roll, man. That's a good show. Yeah, that was great. Like I said, Blu ray play. <laughs> I told you I talk a lot. <laughs> no, dude, it was fantastic. Fantastic. And uh, I thought, you know, we get a lot of authors that come on here, and a lot of them are, aren't as natural as you are. You know, they, they have that stiff upper lip, whereas you're, you just came in and, and conversed, man, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, obviously, I, I take my my writing very serious and, and and the craft and stuff. But I mean, the thing with taking with being serious is you can also take yourself too serious. And I also try to have fun with this. You know, like um, uh, I like to think that uh, the writing that I'm doing is 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 an art form. But I'm also an entertainer. You know, I'm a storyteller. I'm, I'm trying to tell good stories, and I don't think that diminishes the art aspect of it. But it just it just means that I'm not really snooty about it. You know, I just. Uh, uh, I want people to read my stuff and, and enjoy it, you know, because if they enjoy it, then they're more likely to read more. So um, I, I, I write the stuff that I would like to read myself. You know, that's uh, whenever I'm writing and I feel like I'm it's, it's a slog or I'm writing a, a section or a part of a story that 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 feels like work. I know it's going to read like work. <clears throat> I got to fix that. It's got to be fun. You know, it's got to it's got to it's got to it's got to pop, you know. Oh, I hear you. I hear you. My friend, I got to get ready for the news here, but I just wanted to say a big thank you again to you personally for making the time for us, and you were awesome. Thank you so much for doing this, man. Thank you. And um, as for the chat, did you want me to keep answering questions oh, over yeah, there? Yeah, man, you can if you want. Sure, go yeah, right I'll, ahead. If, if, you're, if you're awake, go for it. If you want to go to bed, man, well, you're three hours ahead. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll pop over and see uh, and I'll pull back. <clears throat> And, uh, and throw it a few things there. If there's any direct questions, and then I'll uh, I'll sign off. All right, man. Well, I appreciate you. You take care. Thanks. Thanks very and, much. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Have a good night. Good night. We definitely got to get Corns the booking guy. Let's give a round of applause for Corns the booking guy here. Yep. Yeah. And uh, we definitely got to make sure Corns the booking guy brings Ian back for around Halloween to uh talk about um to talk about some short stories i will post uh i saw it here there it is this is ian's twitter account at one more shadow uh there you go malu from i believe denmark malu from denmark tuning on in tonight and uh yeah we appreciate that we appreciate uh everybody here man we really do I know you clap, Duke. Duke's a closet clapper. 
He doesn't like anybody seeing that when he claps. And, uh, yes. I don't know where Corinth is. I don't know. He's around. I talked to him yesterday. He's booking some great shows right now. Great shows. I know he's been busy with family and around his house. So that's why he hasn't been around. <clears throat> I have this frog in my throat that will just not let loose. Will not let loose at all. What a jerk. Okay, we've got about uh, two minutes here. Thank you, uh, re gorgeous wrench, Jenny. <clears throat> There you go, Cat Chaser. This is for you. Beady little eyes. All right. Big thank you to Dan, Cat Chaser, and Fabster for the amazing super chats. Thank you to all the veterans listening in and all our new subscribers that keep on slamming that sub uh, subscribe button. We really appreciate you. And uh, let's go Yankees, John Hires. Let's go Yankees. We've rounded third. We're heading for Halton tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, at Spaced Out Radio Show. Speaking of the news... news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the dangerous. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have you guys been following this Chinese rocket? This thing could literally hit anywhere on the planet. Yeah, debris from the Chinese rocket could hit Earth at this weekend. Communist Party newspaper claims that Long March 5B should easily burn up in the atmosphere, but experts warn pieces will still reach Earth. The White House has called for responsible space behaviors as a debris from a Chinese rocket thought to be out of control is expected to crash back to Earth sometime on Saturday. Yes, the U.S. Space Command is tracking debris from the Long March 5B, which launched last week the main module of China's first permanent space station into orbit. 
the roughly 30 meter or 100 foot long stage would be among the biggest piece of space debris to fall to Earth. The nonprofit, federally funded Aerospace Corps has said it expects the debris to hit the Pacific near the equator after passing over eastern U.S. cities. The orbit covers a swath of the planet from New Zealand to Newfoundland. The U.S. Defense Department expects it to fall to Earth on Saturday, though where it will hit cannot be pinpointed until within hours of its re-entry, the Pentagon said. The White House Press Secretary, Jen Psaki, has stated the United States is committed to addressing the risks of growing congestion due to space debris and growing activity in space, and we want to work with the international community to promote leadership and responsible space behaviors. Now, China's space agency has yet to say whether the rocket is being controlled or will make an out-of-control descent. But the Global Times newspaper, published by the Chinese Communist Party, has claimed the rocket's thin-skinned aluminum alloy exterior will easily burn up in the atmosphere, posing an extremely remote risk to people. Jonathan McDowell, though, an astrophysicist at Harvard, has predicted some pieces of the rocket will survive re-entry and that it would be the equivalent of a small plane crash scattered over 100 miles. Last time they launched a Long March B-5B rocket, they ended up with big long rods of metal flying through the sky and damaging several buildings along the Ivory Coast. What's bad is that it's really negligent on China's part. Things more than 10 tons, we don't let them fall out of the sky uncontrollably, deliberately. The Long March 5B rocket carried the main module of Tian, or Heavenly Harmony, Heavenly Harmony, you know, isn't that kind of an oxymoron for communist China where you're not allowed to preach to God or think about God or heaven? Either way. Into orbit on 29th of April, China plans 10 more launches to carry additional parts of the space station into orbit. Lucky us. Lucky us. Now, with a real rocket program, let's go over to SpaceX. They just launched another test flight of an early Mars rocket prototype at its South Texas facility, sending the towering silver metal vehicle soaring up to about six miles above Earth, then putting it through a series of aerial acrobatics before relighting two of its engines and landing it upright back on the landing pad. The vehicle, called SN-15, was the fifth of SpaceX rocket prototypes to attempt such a landing and the first to actually do so successfully. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk confirmed the successful landing on Twitter, Starship landing, nominal. It comes after four previous prototypes attempted to safely land after soaring a few miles into the air, with all of the prior missions ending in explosions. SN-15 is an early iteration of Starship, the vehicle that Musk envisions will one day carry the first humans to Mars. The vehicle has several improvements over its predecessors, according to SpaceX. They include upgrades to its hardware, communication and navigation systems, software, and its massive engines, which are called Raptor engines. Musk first explained Starship's intended landing method during a September 2019 media event. He billed it as a unique maneuver that would see the rocket dive back through the air with its belly pointed towards the Earth as its four fins shift slightly to keep it steady. It's a maneuver that Musk said is intended to mimic how a skydiver would fall through the air rather than the straight vertical descent to Earth that SpaceX's Falcon 9 rockets employ when they come in for landings. Perfecting the belly flop landing maneuver is essential to enable a fully reusable transportation system designed to carry both crew and cargo on long duration, interplanetary flights, and help humanity return to the moon and travel to Mars and beyond, according to the company's website. The last prototype to fly, SN-11, exploded during landing, rained shrapnel on a nearby beach, and threatened nearby video equipment that was set up by YouTubers trying to capture footage of the launch. The prototype before that, SN-10, landed upright in March, but independent footage of the event showed the vehicle exploded about three minutes later. 
All of SpaceX Starship's prototypes thus far have been far less powerful than the final product envisioned by Musk. While most of the test vehicles have had three engines, the final spaceship is expected to have more than 30, including a separate massive rocket booster dubbed Super Heavy used for getting to orbit. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. A scientist dubbed the Space Tiger King has claimed that strange puffball-like rocks on Mars are actually mushrooms. Microbiologist Dr. Jinli Wei from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, astrophysicist Dr. Rudolf Schild from Harvard Smithsonian, and Dr. Ron Gabriel Joseph, a.k.a. Space Tiger King, made the claims after studying images snapped by NASA's Curiosity rover on the Red Planet and the orbiting high-rise craft. Their study, which has been met with some skepticism from the community, argues that what NASA calls rocks are actually fungus-like specimens growing on Martian landscape. The trio claim that these mushrooms seem to shrink, appear, and disappear over a period of days, weeks, or months. In one example, the team says there is evidence of fungi resembling puffballs on Earth re-sprouting in tracks left behind by the NASA Curiosity rover. Way, Armstrong, and Joseph have been sifting through NASA's images of Mars for years and have shared their many discoveries with the world on numerous occasions. In April 2020, Armstrong and Joseph released a similar study on ResearchGate that also claimed mushrooms were growing on Mars. Throughout its mission at Eagle Crater, Miradani Planum, uh, the rover Opportunity photographed thousands of mushroom-like lichen formations with thin stalks and spherical caps clustered together in colonies attached to jutting outward from the tops and sides of rocks reads the 2020 paper. Those on top sides were often collectively oriented via their caps and stalks and in a similar upward angle direction as is typical of photosynthesizing organisms. Their wild claims of life on Mars, outside of aliens, were controversial to the scientific community, not exactly helping their credibility as Joseph Space Tiger King's nickname, which appears to have been inspired by his personal BrainMind.com website, which shows him posing with oversized sunglasses in front of a badly photoshopped space-themed background. The 90s-style picture does bring to mind the flamboyant zoo owner Joseph Maldonado Passage, whose documentary gripped the nation last year. Oh, isn't that nice? Moving on, let's get to it. A suspected German fraudster living in Majorca allegedly faked her own death, but her story has a rather obvious giveaway, her pet poodle. The 47-year-old woman arrested by Spanish police is suspected of having embezzled almost $1.2 million from the German solar power firm she worked for, Yes, private detectives hired by the firm sniffed around on social media and found that she owned a giant poodle. Their dogged work actually led to her arrest. The woman is now out on bail and is reportedly admitted having faked her own death. The detectives tracked her down to a chic villa in Santa Ponca after spotting a man walking such a poodle, which is not a very common breed on the island. The largest poodles are often called giant or royal, but are in fact simply large standard poodles at least 15 inches tall at the shoulder. The smaller ones are miniature toy poodles, both dogs pretty ugly if you ask me. On Wednesday, police in Majorca confirmed the details which were initially reported by a local daily newspaper. The story began in November when the woman was summoned to court in Palma, Majorca, but suspicions were raised at the solar power firm she worked for in Rostock, North Germany, when her parents reported that she had died in a car crash in March 2020. Police quoted by Dario de Mallorca said that she had in fact been living in Majorca with false identification documents. I don't think she's getting away. I really don't. Now here's a bad prank. I don't like this stuff. I really don't. Leave nature out of your stupidity. A sock was pulled over a swan's head in a mindless prank that could have literally led to the bird's death. 
Police believe the garment was put on intentionally due to the snug fit and how far down the neck the tube was. Had it not been rescued, officers said the swan found in Colson Road, Lincoln, would have literally starved to death or suffocated. Officers have launched a joint witness appeal with the RSPCA in a bid to try and trace the culprits. Inspector Kate Burris from the Wildlife Charity said the mindless prank could have resulted in this poor swan suffering over a long period of time and ultimately ended in its death. Given that this is the breeding and nesting season, this could have also resulted in suffering and sadly the death of any dependent offspring. Wild birds are protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act in the UK, and it is an offense to kill, injure, or take them without a license. The maximum penalty, if these idiots are caught, will be six months in prison and or an unlimited fine. All right, let's continue on. In Greek mythology, the Hydra is a creature with many heads. In Norse mythology, Odin rides uh, a Sleipner, a horse with many legs. And in the warm coastal waters of Australia, we have another monster, a worm with 100 butts. Yes, yes, a lot of ass on this creature. The creature is shaped somewhat like a tree with a single head and a body that branches over and over and over again, each bifurcation gifted with its own anus. Now, New research on the innards of this mysterious multi-bottom beast revealed that it's even stranger than the inside. Yeah, Ramacillus and one other of the related branching worm Cillus are found exclusively within the pores and canals inside marine sponges. They place their heads somewhere near the sponge's base and run their branches' body through tunnels extended to the outside of the sponge said Teresa Agado, an evolutionary biologist at the University of Gothenburg in Germany, and her colleagues, they think the worm's forked figure is perfectly adapted for life in this Swiss cheese labyrinth. The branch body won't be suitable for swimming around the ocean's water, so it's got to protect itself. However, living inside this sponge, the animal is protected and explores the canals and easily moves around with its 100 asses. While scientists have gathered some understanding of this worm's external anatomy since it was discovered in 2016, little was known on how the worm's insides were put together because apparently this is important science, not trying to figure out real problems. So Agato and her team wasted a bunch of money with a team of researchers in Australia, Spain, and Germany, found wild sponges containing the one worm tangles and brought them to the lab, wasting money delivering it again. There, the researchers used a combination of different imaging strategies to examine the worms and their porous abodes, including the discovery that it has 100 buttholes. The team also dissected the worms out of the sponges, killing them for no reason other than for the sake of science, which you can hide behind anything except UFOs and aliens. And apparently there's going to be a study on this and they figure they were able to count more than 500 branches in one specimen, but they think they could easily reach 100. The team also found the worm's branching is beyond skin deep. Incredibly, each worm forks itself. All the internal organs divide. The guts, the nerves, everything splits and runs. Of course it does. It has 100 buttholes. And you know what? Waste of money. More good money going down the drain for studying of a worm rather than real-world problems. A truck driver in Florida is a lucky, lucky man and very lucky to be alive. He walked away uninjured when several pieces of construction rebar pierced the front of his semi-truck that he was driving. Brevard County Fire Rescue said two work trucks were involved in a crash in West Melbourne, causing rebar being carried by the truck in front to pierce the front of the vehicle that was behind. Now, photos of the scene, pretty eerie, show the rebar stabbed right through the center console of the cab over truck and entered the interior near where the driver's right leg would be. However, somehow, miraculously, Florida man was able to get away without a single scratch of rebar piercing his body. I love this story. A pair of identical twins in Louisiana 
were offered more than $24 million in scholarship offers from the scores of colleges to which they applied. Denisha and Destiny Caldwell, two brilliant young women who are preparing to graduate at the top of their class from Scotlandville Magnet High School in Baton Rouge, say they received offers from more than 200 colleges and universities around the world. We started off competing against each other, and now we complete... With each, and now we compete with each other, Destiny said. The twins have said they've decided to attend the University of California, Los Angeles, otherwise UCLA, to study mathematics and science and seek careers in the medical field. I love that story. Good for those young ladies. Hard work paying off through education. <laughs> Thought of the Nave happens every night at this time, where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, then read your responses on the air, because we love the audience participation around here. We really do. Today's Thought of the Nave is as follows. If you can investigate any UFO crash site or hotspot, tell me which one and why. Start off with Ryan. All the notable ones here in Canada that the government officially acknowledges. Why? Because I have new tech skills, new skills and all. I have a lot of skills because Ryan's skillful, and I know the one famous from the story has never put boots on the ground. Ozzy, Ozzy, sister, sister. I've got to choose one in Australia. Why Cliff Wells? Sightings nearly every other day. Greg. The ocean between Los Angeles and Catalina Island. I think it's an entrance to inner earth. You could very well be right, Greg. John, Skinwalker Ranch. It seems to be most active. Doesn't, uh, don't really want to investigate a place that has been gone over with a fine tooth comb. Fine tooth comb? Fine tune comb? Come on. Anyways, and nothing going on. I want activity, just not so much radiation. Thanks. Carl, Aurora, Texas. This one was a long time ago. In my opinion, much of the attention was paid to burying the occupant. It would be interesting to metal detect that site. Chris, otherwise known as Chrisomania, he wants to see more on Roswell. Adam wants to know more about Devil's Tower because it had a great film evidence. Yes, and don't forget Close Encounters. Team Stump all the way, by the way. Alien Babble, Operia Wex to catch a Tic Tac in action. All right. Lori, Shag Harbor, love to cover the harbor and around the outlet with radar and magnetic equipment to find any leftovers from the craft. That would be cool. That would be very, very cool. Mike, once you see a UFO crash, it's best to stay away from it. Those creatures work with radioactive energy. Well, not them. It is their craft. Upon a crash, spread all over. Radioactive crap everywhere. You don't want to smell it. You don't want to see it. It will kill you. Stay away. I think it killed him once, and he was able to escape from it. Joshua Skinwalker Ranch, from all the stories, it's like you're almost guaranteed to have some sort of paranormal experience. For Davey, it's Rendlesham. Deb, Kecksburg in Pennsylvania. I want to talk to those guys who were kids at the time and rode into the forest on their bikes, evading the brass. Catherine wants Skinwalker Ranch. Magnus. I would want to go to the one in Aurora, Texas, because I think there is still some more validity to it. I also love Tex-Mex food. Bobby Bobby wants to investigate SOR headquarters. Janine, I'd like it to be 1967. Flying Air Canada to Halifax to see what the pilot saw at Shag Harbor. Joe and Joe's Bane, he's got aliens. He gets the final word. Going to a known UFO crash site and investigating is like going to someone's front yard and investigating the deer that they saw two years ago eating some grass. Thank you to everybody playing along in the thought of the day. We'll do it again very, very soon on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you to Captain Shirk for the SOR Newswire and, of course, to Ian Rogers for telling us some UFO and ghost stories. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brothers watching. 
Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening, listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight on YouTube, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Twitch, and on Twitter on Periscope, Facebook, and on Twitter with Derek and the Snarkheads at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, say it with me, we own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. Good night.